I appreciate I appreciate you having me and, and to the audience like I know that a lot of the stuff that I, I say can be uh, triggering and I want to make it clear that it's not my intention to do that um, at all. Uh, it's just me sharing beliefs that uh, as I understand the world and that is no way projection on you or how you see the world, et cetera. It's just this is how I see the world. And these are beliefs that serve me well, um, that helped me overcome um, a lot of things that I thought mattered. I'm Alex Ramosi. Welcome back to the Ice Coffee Hour podcast. And this podcast has made four hundred thousand dollars in the last eighteen months. That's a good guess. It was a <laughs> good guess. Dees, getting closer. Yeah, yeah. It's one hundred and sixty-eight thousand seven hundred and fifty-six dollars. Okay. Yeah. I probably backtracked what current revenue is to earlier. That was probably no. You were saying like, oh, we think at forty thousand uh, dollars yeah. a month and ad. No way. No, nowhere close to nope, that. Really? No. No, last probably 28 days, we probably did like ten. what, 10 grand? 10, 10 grand? 10. Yeah. Yeah. Ad rates are down this year. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. My channel, which is like not even like a legit YouTube channel, um, does like 28,000 a month. How many views do you pull? 4 million a month right now. That's why. Yeah. So we sense. get, because we only post once a week. Uh -huh. So we only post four episodes every month. And okay. Because of that, views are on like one to two million a month. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because if it, because you probably have a big, I would imagine, decent businessy audience because yes. mine's pretty much all business owners yeah the rpms are definitely stuff. pretty high in our audience yeah. Right. okay yeah, yeah yeah what we need to do we need to post twice a week that's the only way yeah. we can take this podcast to the next level because yeah. we kind of hit i don't want to say we've uh you know we've done as much as we could for one episode a week yeah we gotta go to two yeah i think that's the next step mm-hmm I agree. So, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> Alex. As, as resident YouTube advisor, thank uh, you. Uh, between everybody thanks here, so much. you know, yeah. and we'll do it. Yeah, we'll do it. So, I gotta say, man, I've really enjoyed this story of yours. Uh, I listened to the My First Million podcast of you, and I thought it was really good. And you gave such a complete breakdown on just like sales, being an entrepreneur, and making a ton of money. So, tell that's us, relative. yeah, <laughs> and, and that's it. <laughs> that's the important part we're going to talk about today. So, tell us your tell us your story. Did you go to college? Yeah. What were you like as a student? How did yeah. you get these ideas? What did you want to be when you grew up? Wealthy. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was definitely like my primary goal. So I was um, I was actually a really good student. So I don't think I have the traditional entrepreneur like you know skill. Like school failed me. Like I couldn't focus on classes or anything like that. Like I was actually a really good student. I was um, vice president of the newspaper. I was editor in chief of the uh, creative magazine. Um, played three varsity sports. Did well. Um, went to Vanderbilt. Uh, for my undergrad, uh, graduated in three years. Um, just kind of was always like trying to just push. Um, a lot of that was because I had like the, the traditional Middle Eastern parents who were like, you had a hundred different tests that you got a hundred on, but this one you had a 99. And then they're <laughs> failure, just like, they're failure. Like, yeah. what, did, what did you miss? Like, <laughs> that was actually like a good story. And I was like, oh, I'll never place him. Okay, that's useful to know. Um, and so anyways, I, I did that and then kind of followed the path, which was to do management consulting or investment banking. Um, after you kind of go like through the white bread path, um, I did management consulting because it seemed like more interesting. Mm -hmm. I did defense contracting. So I was in the public sector. So we did space, cyber and intelligence for the military for two. I say we, I um, did that for two years, which sounds really cool, but was actually just transcribing interviews and then compiling 600 pages of notes and then color coding them and then trying to give them to people ahead of me and so that they could make a 20 point slide deck that would be sold for $4 million mm. back to the military of like how they should combine their assets to kill the most bad guys for the least amount of money. Um, just like complex problems. Mm. Um, and so I did that for two years and then wanted to not do that. Uh, so I was going to go to business school and then was <laughs> able to uh, do really well in the GMAT. Um, so I think I scored above Harvard Smith score. And so I was like, okay, cool. I think I can get into like with my experience. And what's the, the GMAT? Uh, it's like the SAT for business school. Huh. So it's like a higher, like a harder SAT, basically. Huh. Um, and then anyway, so I, I I did that, and then I started applying to these business schools. And on one of them, it was like, how will this business school MBA help your short and long term goals? And for like four days, I just sat there and like couldn't answer this question because <laughs> I wanted to like start a business and I like couldn't figure out how was how spending like 200 grand and like two to three years of my life and not making money during that period of time was going to like help me. Um, and so I was like, you know what, I'd rather just take the money and start a business and, and, and see. And so I'd saved up like, I think 60 grand at that point. So I was 24 and, or 23, I was 23 cause I graduated early. So, um, I took, took the money. Um, I looked at a bunch of different businesses. And so I, look, I was going to start either a test prep business 
because I was, I was good at that um, for like SATs or whatever because there's really good margins in that mm-hmm. business. Um, I frozen yogurt store because Ooh, those were like yeah. blowing up like 10 what, years what ago. What year right? was this? 2012 oh, was when yeah, I was looking at it. Right? Yeah. So I was, I like, was the I was exact like, same. Hot. For me, I wanted to open up a, uh, a, a Froyo store. I think it was 2013 or 2014. Yeah. We could talk about that a little later. I know a lot what about a the yogurt disaster. business. disaster. Oh, it's like, bad. Like yeah. cost per ounce, like yeah. percentage of people who do toppings versus not. Like there's way, there's a lot in it. But um, it was that. And then the third was just like, do something I'm passionate about. Like I like fitness. Like maybe I'll do something there. Um, and I didn't have enough money for the yogurt store. So that one was out. Um, I had enough money for the test prep and I did a bunch of work for it and I was going to like partner with somebody for it. And then that kind of fell through. So it kind of like left this weird like taste in my mouth. So I was like, I guess I'll just do the gym thing. And so I knew from the consulting world that like the best way to learn is to consult with experts. Like that's how you rapidly like learn new subjects for like, I don't know anything about defense, like about satellite mixes and stuff, but like you interview a hundred people who are experts in it and like you get a pretty good idea pretty fast. And so I was like, okay, I don't know anything about the gym business. So I'll just email a bunch of gym owners and see if they'll just like let me work for free. And um, one guy got back to me, I emailed like 40 gyms and he was like, uh, yeah, come on out. You can work for free. <laughs> so I was like, all right, awesome. So I left every, all my, I like sold my condo, sold all my stuff, packed my car and I drove straight uh, to California from Baltimore, which is where I was. Um, showed up at this guy's doorstep and he was like, this is really creepy. I was not really actually expecting you to do this. I was like, what do you want me to do? And he's like, I don't know. Like I have stuff to do. Um, you can hang out here for a little bit. And he's like, where are you staying? And I was like, I don't know. I just got here. I just drove to your gym from my house in Baltimore. And he was like, so you have nowhere to stay. And I was like, no, I figured I figured out. Wait, where was this located? In California. So you drove from Baltimore to California. Yeah, it was 36 hours. I packed food. You didn't do it. You slept though, right? Like you didn't do it. Yeah, yeah, I slept. I slept, but I didn't stop for food or or asking the important questions. I'm just, I'm just, I'm I'm amazed. 36 (laughs) hours. And he was, he was surprised you even did it. Yeah. You didn't call him while you were driving, like on the way, like, hey man, just letting you know, I'm like, I'm on the way. I I mean, we talked once and I was like, all right, I'll be there. And then, I mean, I'm sure people I would, say that kind of yeah, stuff Yeah, you would think that, like, hey, I'm on my way. I'll be there at, like, <laughs> yeah. this, this time. I, like, I didn't get, even have his phone number. What? I think I just you just showed up like, at his house? I showed up at his gym. Wait, I oh, at his gym. gym. Yeah. So, this, uh, so, wait, so if you didn't have his number, how did you correspond? So, we email. So, I opted in and then he emailed me. And then and then we, we did have a call, but I don't think it was his cell phone. Because I think there was, like, a work, like, a, bus- like sure. a business phone. It was, like, how many years ago? Mm-hmm. Um so anyways, he, what did uh, your parents think of that, by the way, your parents were probably telling you, do not do this. Wildly do not do against this. all yeah. of this. Yeah. Like, wildly. cause they wanted yeah. you to go into something more like academic. They're right? like, yeah. just the get They're Like you ace the GMAT, yeah. like you can get into business school and then you can go continue on the path, you mm-hmm. know? And I, um, I mean, basically what I figured out was that the amount of money that I wanted to make, no job would pay me with the exception of investment banking and management consulting. So you can make five, 10, 20 million a year as an investment banker or in private equity or as a management consultant, like you can do that. Um, but the path to getting there, the traditional way, you pretty much give 20 years and then you start making that. And I was like, well, I don't wanna give up my youth to have money later that I won't have like the youth mm-hmm. or energy to spend. So that was kind of the thought process was like, I'm guaranteed to not get what I want this way and I have a chance of getting what I want this way. So I decided to go that way. And that was pretty, it was like the risk adjusted return was I have 100% guarantee that I'm not gonna get what I want here. Even mm-hmm. though like people will think it's, good um which is kind of an interesting side note is that like every one of the big advancements that i've had in my life and i've like marked all of them like i added a zero to my income uh like per month and each time it was by giving up something that everyone else told me was really good to have something that was better but it's like the one that you have and giving it up for something that you do not know exists yet but you believe can exist and i think that's the hardest like jump in life like those jumps it's Mm -hmm. like i had a really good job um and i was going to start a business it's like but you have this thing that everybody will give you status for. But I want to do this. Mm-hmm. And then like I scaled that up to six locations, you know, fast forward three years. And people wait, 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 let, let's yeah, hear more yeah, about you it. Skipping, you're skipping, skipping this. too much, too much. Okay. No, no, you show up this guy's gym and it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> then what yeah. happens? Yeah, so if he was actually um, really cool about it. Um, and I always remember this. He actually just died last year um, from COVID. But um, No way. Yeah, it was wow. really sad um, for a lot of reasons because yeah. he was also like incredibly jacked. He's Persian like me, like really into the business scene, was a pretty big influencer. Um, so there's a lot of like similarities. And we he had like a like a sort of father-son dynamic, you know what I mean? Um, and so anyways, yeah. uh, he was like, well, 
dude, if you don't have anywhere to stay, you can stay at my place tonight. And I was like, oh, thanks. And so I went to his place and I stayed there for uh, that night and his like wife made me food or whatever. And I was like, this is nice. Like California is great. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the next morning I went to the gym with him and then he just like literally just asked everyone at the gym. He's like, anyone have an extra room? And one guy was like, you can stay at my place. And so he had an extra room. I paid him like 400 bucks a month. And mm. that was, uh, that was how I, that was how I like started living. I worked at that gym for, for three months. Um, so what were you doing at the gym though? So he said, you can be my apprentice. And so, I mean, I think he recognized that I was like relatively intelligent and hardworking. And so he was like, just learn everything that I do so that I don't have to do it and you can do it. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, and so like, I was with him from 4 a.m. until 4 p.m. every day. Cause so like my early mornings kind of started with him cause he was like, be at the gym at four. And I was like, okay, got it. You know, cause in the consulting world, I was at the office at 10. So it was like, mm -hmm. like a big mm -hmm. difference. And so we would work out from four to five and then we would start working at five. And so that was, and then he was like, man, everybody always says that like, you can't uh, like work really hard. Like you have to trade off. He's like, he's like, they're just not willing to wake up early. He's like, I get, I see my kids at four or five o'clock every day. He's like, I just wake up before they're up. And I was like, hmm. what time does he go to bed? He's going to bed at like nine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I go to bed at night. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so that actually is kind of stuck with me is that like, there's so many hours before people wake up that like, you can get like the high quality work done. But anyways, did the three months with him. And he was like, Hey, there's this guy, um, who's got a gym like close by to where you want to open a gym. Maybe you guys should partner up. And I was like, cool. Sounds good. Um, so I found a spot, met the guy and, uh, we were like, okay, which is terrible way to do a partnership. Like you guys both have the exact same role and let's just split a facility, which makes no sense. But anyways, um, he was like, we should go to this marketing event. And I was like, sure. Marketing is important. Like I didn't know anything. Um, and he's like, yeah, it's it, the guy said that if you don't make $10,000 by the end of the weekend, uh, you can get your money back. And it was $3,000. And I was like, that's a lot. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Of money. Like I don't have a ton. And so, um, I, I decided to do it cause I was like, well, if I don't make 10 grand, I'll get the money back. Right. Um, I didn't make 10 grand <laughs> by the end of the weekend. I did not, but he did teach this thing that was kind of crazy and new at the time called Facebook ads. It was 2013. And so, um, learned, uh, learned enough to understand that there was like something here, went back to Sam's gym, which is the guy Wait, who, hold up, hold up. Did you get your money back? I didn't No, I didn't ask for it, but I, I learned enough. <laughs> okay. So you didn't like, make the amount of money that they like, promised. I didn't make anything. I didn't make anything. But, but you how, made no money with your Facebook ads? But how did they ads? promise will give you the money back and you didn't get the money back? Yeah. How, he said I, you can ask for it. It's just like, I wasn't. How much was it? Ask for. It, was it was three grand. He said, if you don't make 10 grand by the end of the weekend, you can ask for your money back. How are people making 10 grand by the end of the weekend? I'm, I take it they're setting up a, a Facebook, uh, like a Shopify store, well, running Facebook be, ads. It would be like lead ads to a call, then you sell them something. Got it. Yeah, I mean, so like, and I was the only guy there who didn't have a business. So like from a selection standpoint, I shouldn't have been selected yeah. to attend. Got so it was like it. a tiny little workshop of like 10, 10 dudes who all owned gyms. And so they had businesses that they could like sell people into. Oh, I got didn't it. have anything. I was like, what am I supposed to sell? But I like, I understand he had like, this is how you build landing pages, this how you build ads. And I was like, just trying to like understand it. Um, and I didn't, but like, I got enough of it to go back to Sam and be like, we should run Facebook ads. And he was like, doesn't work. <laughs> it's like, I tried it once. It's not, it's not for us. And I was like, well, give me a budget. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. And so I ran ads at his gym mm -hmm. and we killed it. And so I was like, okay, awesome. Like I'm going to do this at, at the gym that I'm now starting with this partner. And the night before the lease was supposed to get signed, uh, the partner couldn't come up with half the money to do the gym. And so the night before I ended up assuming the entire gym. Um, how much did that cost? So it was supposed to be both. We're going to put 25 grand in. Um, and I had 60. And so it went from uh, <laughs> me having like some padding to no padding. Uh, so it was 50 grand and I had 60. Um, and so I had like $10,000 left, which is enough for two months rent um, at that gym. So I stopped living at the, the place in Chino um, <clears throat> and started sleeping at the gym because I couldn't afford two mm -hmm. rents. And so um, I remember selling the entire first month and making exactly $4,973, which is the exact amount of the rent. And so then I just watched it go back down to zero and I was like, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. um, but the next month we made 10 grand, the next month we made 15, then 20, then 20. It was like five grand a month, all the way up to like 35,000 a month, pretty much by month. Then um, I started hiring people and bringing people in. And then at by month like nine, it was, it was all outsourced. So I had the, like a manager and some trainers and whatnot. Then I had two guys come in. I, there's a very long story here. Like, <laughs> like yeah. I can, I can skip through it. But um, anyways, it started, it started working, started opening um, a new location every six months because we kind of did something a little different where we figured out 
I could liquidate the cost of acquisition for new customers and make money in the acquisition. So like I would put a dollar in and I would get $30 back before having a back end. So it was like, it was almost more advantageous How? to just open what, more gyms. So what, but I made what, some money. but what was that one to 30? Yeah. So it's like walking through the process. It's like, if I had, um, $2 leads, right. And I know that I'm going to close one out of five leads. It's like my cost of acquisition is 10 bucks and I'm selling a $500 thing. And then 48 hours later, I'm going to sell $250 of supplements. And then three weeks after that, I'm going to sell them a year paid in full up front with a discount. And so if you follow the cash flow, it's like I put $10 out, then I got 500 and then I got 250 yeah. and then I got a thousand. Well, yeah. And so it's like, it was insane. What was the business model of the gym? Like how many people would be signing up for it? How many people would be actually showing up? Yeah. What was the cost of that? Yeah. So we sold, we kind of had a different model than most people. And I think that's why it ended up working well is that most gyms tend to like, I call it like the sell your soul problem, which is like, you just, they just give away as much as they possibly can on the front end to attract people, but it attracts in general, less committed people. They don't actually follow through because they don't really value it. Um, and so we just kind of flipped the model on its head, which is like charge people when they're the most excited up front. Uh, so like charge them $500 for define in program rather than a membership because no one really wants a membership. They just want like a result. So sell them the result and then put like a really compelling guarantee around that. Um, and so the offer that we had at that point was like lose 20 pounds and you get all the money back. And so people were like, oh, that's awesome. So it's like they kind of like bet on themselves to hit the goal. But once they were in the mousetrap, it didn't really matter because as soon as they came in, we'd sell them products. So that would already cover even if they did refund because they were going to buy the products and that wasn't refundable. And then, you know, three weeks in, it's like, hey, you know, Lucy, you just lost 12 pounds. You need to hit 20. Once you hit 20, are you like, you done forever? Like your body's perfect. And they're like, no, I really want to keep going. And you're like, right. So then you understand that this is not about six weeks. It's about six years. So why don't we just take that, you know, $500. I'll give it to you like you want it. And we'll just credit towards you staying. And she's like, okay. And it's like, cool, new agreement, sign. And then the money disappears, right? And so it didn't really mm -hmm. matter. And so, um, and then, yeah, and we'd give them, you know, a paid in full for the year discount if they wanted to like pay it all then, or we just discount it off of like the next 12 months or whatever. Got it. How did lose the 20 pounds? Uh, how do you stick with that? Is that with a trainer or is it like if you follow this planned outline? Yeah. So there out? was three things where I mean, I'm going to get into my, my fitness selling days, but it's like yeah. fitness, nutrition, accountability. So like fitness wise, you got to work out of the gym three times a week with a trainer. We'll walk you through everything. We'll show you what to do. Can you do that? Yes. Cool. Second thing is nutrition. We'll walk you through a nutrition plan that's made specifically for you. You'll have, you know, grocery list, free preparation instructions, eating out guides, everything that you need to make sure that you can get to where you're trying to go and make it as easy as possible. I've got kids who don't speak English and 12 year olds who can do it. Do you think you can handle that? They say yes. And he's like, great. Third thing is accountability. So it doesn't matter what plan I sold 4,000 of these, so like, <laughs> I can still do it and spend 10 years. Um, and so it's like, you know, I can give you the best plan in the world and the you know best training, best nutrition, but if you don't show up, it doesn't matter. Right. Right. Okay, cool. So the reason that we have such a high success rate is that we have three forms of accountability. One is that you have peer to peer accountability of other people you're going to be starting with who are in the same spot as you. Next is you have alumni accountability. So people further ahead of you who are going to be pulling you and cheering you ahead because they've done it. And then you've got expert accountability from the coaches who've done this a hundred times. Right. And the last one and the most important one is that the reason we have the success rate we do, which at that time we were doing about 78% of people who started would hit the goal, which is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. It's actually way more impressive than yeah. most like weight loss programs is that people basically make a bet on themselves. And so, so you pay $500, you do everything, you hit the goal, we'll give you the whole thing back. Right. And that was pretty much the explanation. So I was like, that makes sense. So cool. how much money were you making from like actually selling the, the membership or whatever, mm -hmm. because you said you're giving that money back to them versus how much your mo we didn't money. We did actually, if you follow the cash, right? So it's like, right, right. Versus over. how much money yeah. you're making, like with the supplements and with like all of these other things. So it was like about 50, 50 in terms of like membership on the back end, ver like, cause like in the beginning, there's way more front end sales than there's mm -hmm. back end. And then the back end can continues to grow and kind of compound. Um, but yeah, we was like about 50, 50 between front end and, and back end in terms of like cash flow. Got it. Cause I know with a lot of gyms, don't they try to get a lot of people in around new years, just expecting that like 80% yeah. of people are never going to show up. It depends on the type of gym. So it, it, the gyms kind of exist on a continuum on this side. You've got like what I call facility leasage, um, gyms, which are like, you know, anytime fitness, planet fitness, like they just, the, the business model is based on 92% of people not showing up. Like it couldn't work because if, if, if hundred people, hundred percent of people actually showed up, they would have to charge 200 to $300 a month because there wouldn't be space. Okay. So once you've started expanding these gyms, yeah. why not just continue on that? It was a great question. Yeah. So I, yeah, I had six, um, and I had my next four locations. So I was going to get to 10. I had United fitness. It was going to be like America's gym. I was like very 
motivated to do it. Um, and I joined an internet marketing mastermind, uh, which was like a click funnels mastermind mm-hmm. by Russell Brunson. This is like six years ago or seven years ago. And, um, anyways, I, I, I went there and <laughs> the sales guy was like, Oh yeah, there's tons of like gym owners here. And I mean, I, 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 it's all like, we're all good. You know what I mean? But like, um, he's like, yeah, tons of guys like, you know, learn and they make even more money doing internet stuff or whatever. And I was like, all right, cool. If there's other gym owners and stuff like, cool. So I show up, I'm the only brick and mortar business owner. Every single person in the group is an internet person. And I was like, what am I doing? Here? <laughs> um, and I think at the time it was like $25,000. So like I had more money at this time, but it was still a significant chunk of change. Um, and so I got up there and I was like, well, I kind of just walked them through what I just walked you through. Is like, this yeah. is my model. This is how we car customers. This is our LTV. This is our cost of acquisitions. How much it costs me to open a gym. This is how many like gyms I can open per per month based on this cash flow, whatever. And I like talked really fast, and I was like, mm-hmm. "So, what do you guys think?" <laughs> yeah. And um, Russell at the time was like, "I don't think you should be in the gym business." And I it, like it actually like k- killed me because I was like in front of all these people. I like gave this like whole spiel about like why I thought it was awesome. And he was like. I think you should be showing other people how to do exactly what you just talked through. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then he said like the sentence that changed my life, which was, um, I think you have a level 10 skill set and a level two opportunity. He's like, I think you should be like building these types of businesses, not like opening and running gyms. And so that really changed my life because at that point I was like, well, either I don't listen to the guy and just continue down this path or I, you know, accept that he has more money than me. And, Therefore, you know, I don't I necessarily think it's black and white now, but you know, I was like, he has a lot more money than me. And if I don't listen to him, then why did I pay for this? And so I was like, okay. And so in the next 90 days I sold all my gyms, um, not for a ton of money. I think in cumulative, like, I think I sold them for like maybe 300 grand. It wasn't a lot. It really, why so Wait, but You were making yeah. so much money off the gyms. Yeah. I was making like <clears throat> there's overhead and every, all the cash flow. like I wasn't taking dividends, which is a, which is a lesson I can talk about later. Um, so like I took all the cash in each gym and just opened up new gyms, right? And that was like basically what mm-hmm. I did. Um, and like I under, like I feel like through like my entrepreneurial journey, it's been like I very much have come from the, the extreme side of like selling and value and building stuff that people want. And then there's like this other extreme, which is like investors. And I think as you like age, you kind of meet in the middle. Cause I've got some friends who like started investing and then they started buying small businesses and they started getting better at business. They started getting better at marketing, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I was on this side, like I understood how to like make money, but then like, didn't really understand like capital allocation. I didn't understand like how debt worked. I didn't understand how like the, like the equity in the companies actually had value. Like, you know what I mean? Like for me, it was just like, Oh, all these gyms are a lot of work. I wonder if somebody will just like take them off my hands. Mm. And so, um, I probably could have waited like a year and like got them ready for sale and like, you know, cleaned up all the books and like done all that stuff. But, um, I've just been a huge proponent of opportunity cost. And like within 30 days I was doing a hundred grand a month in the next business. So like, Mm. you know, and I was taking home a hundred grand a month, which was more than I was taking home from the six gyms. Um, so it was just like, okay, well that worked. And so like at the end of the day, like whatever we should be doing could probably make us 10 times more than what we're currently doing. And like the faster we can switch to that thing. Got it. Like it makes more. So more how sense. did you switch to teaching other people how to do that model? Yeah. So, um, I was debating doing a franchise. Um, so there's, there's three basically different models that you can do to expand a brick and mortar service type business. You can either franchise, you can license, or you can, um, or you can do, you can privately own them all, right? That's kind of like the, the three big paths. Um, I had a friend who had done the franchise thing. I flew out um, to one of her facilities. We spent the whole weekend together. She told me about all the pros and cons. And it was, she was like, it's really slow. It's very litigious. And I was like, I'm like 26 at the time. I'm like, I don't know if I want to deal with all that. That's kind of sucks. Um, on the private ownership side, I'd already done that. So I was like, I guess I'll license. And so, um, but the in-between there was like, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to license still. So I was like, well, I just know that I make a ton of money opening gyms. So I'll just go and open a ton of gyms, but I'll just give the gyms to the other people. So that's when gym launch actually started was I would fly out to a gym and I would fill it up doing all the stuff I knew how to do at my gyms. And I would just keep all the money and they would get all the customers for free. So that was the deal. So I would risk my money, risk my time, do all that, like run all the ads, everything. And all the cash that I collected was mine. And then they would get 200 free customers that they would convert on the back into their membership. Yeah. How do you ensure that they actually do a good job with those customers? That you don't excellent. bring them a whole bunch of people and they're just like, all right, see ya. Excellent, yeah. excellent uh, <laughs> question. Yeah. Uh, that was the hole in the model. Ah, yeah. uh, and so all these gyms that were coming to me who wanted the help were typically not that good. 
you know, uh, and, and that's not a, that's not an insult to them. It's just, you know, they didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would sell 200 people into a gym that currently had 70 members. They'd go from 70, 270 in like 30 days. And they didn't have the systems. They didn't have the bandwidth. They didn't have the trainers, any of that. And so what ended up happening is I did that for, and then we started getting like refunds and chargebacks. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what the hell? But like, I'm the one who carries the bag on the processing. Cause I was the one who processed the money. So they were doing a bad job, but I was the one who was holding the risk. Um, and so I, uh, like in, in two gyms at one point got on a chair and told every single person to refund. Cause they're like, I just can't deal with all these people. Like just go home. They're literally just were wow. like, go home. And so I had like $150,000 in refunds in a week. And that's when I was like, all right, I'm done with the gym business. Like, you know, I had my gyms, I did this turnaround thing, which was almost two years that Layla and I were flying out to gyms. We scaled up to like eight sales guys doing eight gyms a month. So like it became an operation we're doing, I think at a highest month was like, like 350, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So like it was, it was a decent sized operation. Um, but we, uh, anyways, they did that and Layla, my wife now had this little like side online business where she would like train people. And so I was like, you know what, screw this. Why don't we make you the front person? I'll be behind the scenes and we'll just take the eight sales guys and we'll just sell fitness direct and not do the gym thing anymore. And so that actually started to work. And so we started doing a thousand bucks a day within like 14 days. And so I was like, we take the eight guys, we'll do 8,000 a day. Like this could work. How do you build these businesses so fast? Every single business you've told me so far, <laughs> yeah, it's like, all right, in day. one week, yeah. we're yeah. like doing 300 grand yeah. a year. You know, it's like, so I mean, acquisition.com, the reason it's called that is like acquisition has never been the bottleneck in any business I've ever had. Like we know how to get customers. Um, and so like we knew how to market and sell. And so we knew how to do that. And so that's what we did. So we knew how to run ads. We knew how to get on the phone and talk to people who didn't know us and get them to give us their money. Um, and so that's what we did. And then what ended up happening, this was like the craziest thing of my life is that I had eight gyms that were supposed to launch the next month. And we started, this thing started working her, like the fitness thing. So I called up the first gym and was like, Hey man, like changing model. Like I'm not flying out, you know, and they didn't pay for me to do this. They basically just reserved a date and I would fly out or one of our team, you know, would fly out. We'd launch the ads and we'd sell. I was like, sorry, man, not going to happen. He's like, dude, I just refinanced my house. I maxed out all my credit cards. Like just to make this gym work. I've been doing this for three years. Like you, you launched my buddy's gym and he's like totally pumped and his gym's packed. It's like, I need, like, you have to do this. And, and I was like, all right, man, um, I'm not flying out. Like I'm not, I'm not going to do what I did. I was like, but I can, I can show you how to do it. Um, I'm call it my getting out of the gym business, like mm. sell my secret sale. Um, he's like, well, how much? And I was like, and I remember thinking like the highest number I could possibly imagine, which was at the time, $6,000. Like that was like the highest number I could just to show you where I was. Um, and he was like done. And I just remember like staring at the phone and being like, holy shit, $6,000 <laughs> like, hot damn. <clears throat> um, and so I, you know, called the next guy, had the exact same conversation. He was like, how much? And I was like, eight grand. And he was like, okay. And I called the, re the, the next six guys and we did like $60,000 in sales in that mm -hmm. day, just selling like my entire like system of how I would fill the gyms up and all that stuff. And I was like, holy shit. And I looked at Layla, I was like, I think we're still in the gym business. I was like, I think we're just doing it wrong. And so then I called back all the 30, 40 gyms that we'd already done the turnarounds for. And I was like, remember how I filled your gym up? They were like, yeah. I was like, remember how I made all that money and you didn't? And they were like, yeah, f you for that. <laughs> and then I was like, want me to show you how I did it? And they were like, really? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, done. Cause they'd mm. seen how much money I'd taken out of their job. Right. And so I like overnight I had sold, like we did like 300 and so, like we again did like 300 grand, but this time there was no operational drag. Cause it was just like the same, like the cost of making the thing once versus selling it a hundred times was the same. And that was when I basically understood the, the value of having leverage. So could you explain acquisition.com? So you, yeah. what does it do? Yeah. What's the so, process? Um, it's, it's, we call it value acceleration capital. But if you were to look at like three circles on a table and you've got like private equity, uh, venture capital, and then management consulting, it's kind of like the intersection of those three. So it's like, we deal with companies that are typically smaller than most private equity. So ours are like one to $10 million in EBITDA. Mm -hmm. So, so for people who don't know what that means, it's just like fancy word for profit, just use it as that, right? Um, the amount of money that a company's taken home, most of the companies that we're working with are like three is the minimum top line cutoff. Most of the times they're at like five to like 25 million ish. Mm -hmm. um, I think the smallest company we have right now is 5 million. Next smallest is like 10. So like, and then after that, they're all bigger. Um, and so what we do is we, we take a minority stake in the company. Um, and I'm using this as kind of my way to practice being a majority owner 
without being a majority owner. Mm -hmm. So we're doing everything exactly as we would if we were to take over the entire company. Um, and so we kind of follow a three-step process. So the first thing we do is we, we, we get the data infrastructure in place. And so typically a company of that size that's doing like, you know, 1 million, 2 million, 5 million in EBITDA, um, you know, they got there pretty quickly. They don't have infrastructure. The reporting's shit. Their finances are terrible. Like everything's a mess, but like they know how to sell and they've got some product market fit. And so, um, we go in and just get all of the data correct so we can actually like make good decisions. So once we have the correct data, uh, then we come up with kind of our strategic plan of like, okay, what kind of company do we want to build? Where do we think like the biggest leverage opportunities exist? And then we put them all out and then we're like, okay, there's a lot of things we could do. What are the two things we're going to do? And then we just disregard everything else and just ruthlessly focus on those two things. And then, um, and then the third kind of arm of what we do is we're very good at recruiting. And so like the reason we're able to build so many companies is that we're very good at finding talent. And so, um, kind of an interesting framework for, for you guys as, or for your audience. Mm -hmm is I think a lot of times we talk about like pipelines in terms of like building businesses. It's like, how do I turn raw attention into leads, into prospects, into customers, et cetera. But there's a second acquisition channel, which is like, how do I market to get applications that I then interview, which is the same as the sale, just internal, right? And then how do I onboard, which is the same as onboarding a customer? And then how do I send, which is the same thing, how do I send a customer? So there's mirror, mirror acquisition pipelines that are happening on both sides of a business. As this one flows in with new customers, you so too need one that flows in. Uh, with recruiting to build the infrastructure of the company. And so most of the times the companies that we're working with have this sort of, and none of this, and they don't have the infrastructure upon which to build. And so it's like, we get the right data to make the right decisions. And then we fill the people that can actually execute that vision. So that like a lot of times people, most entrepreneurs think, and, and rightfully so usually, but like under 3 million, 5 million, like the entrepreneur needs to learn more. Um, and typically the company will be a subset of the entrepreneur's knowledge. So it's like, I can do every job in my company better than all the people who are currently doing it. And all of them have learned from me. That's a really terrible way to build a business because it's literally just you and no one's smarter than you. Mm -hmm. And businesses are always <clears> the, <throat> the, the accumulation of all of the brains in it. But if the brains are all a subset of yours, it's the accumulation of one brain, which the bigger your brain, great. But, <laughs> mm. but like, it's way better to have like 10 good brains that are, that all know different things. And so that's when uh, we kind of have to be like, it's not about you learning more. Like we need to get someone who's already done this 10 times in companies just like this. So we need to go find a director of finance. We need to go find a, you know, a controller. We need to go find, you know, a recruiter. We need to go find X, Y, and Z to really build the company into what it needs to become rather than like the uh, transition from the genius with a thousand hands, mm -hmm. uh, which is what most companies are at that point to like an actual company that has people who can drive growth in their respective apartments. So I probably the, just talked yeah. straight for like an hour. So yeah. <laughs> what's, what's the end goal with it? Do you want to now sell this or is your, no. is your goal is to have a whole bunch of small ownership interests? I think in eventually like I'll, I'll do majority buyouts. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for the next five years minimum, I'm focused on these minority deals to prove track record. Um, but I'm not planning on raising money. Um, I don't need it. Um, I want to, there's a lot of checkboxes that acquisition.com met, which is like, I wanted to have something that, uh, I would have a lot of new different businesses that I could like interact with. Um, I wanted to still have one singular focus, which is a difficult, uh, balance to strike between those things, which is why I ended up selling the majority of those three to just go all in on the portfolio being the one thing rather than like, I have three companies and I have my portfolio, which for me, I can't mm -hmm. handle. Um, most people are probably better than I am and that's probably they can do it, but I can't do it. Um, and so, uh, it had to have a way that I could actively get returns on my own money because like, it's great to invest, but like, I know the stuff that I'm buying, I, I know what it's worth and I know how to improve it. Um, so I can just, I can just get so much better value from my money, um, in doing these types of transactions and these types of deals. Um, and so ultimately I want to build something that I don't ever want to sell. I don't think I'm going to transact like, the only type of transaction that I would ever do would be some sort of like very minority participation of like Mosey nation, friends and family and things like that. I might sell like 5% to mm -hmm. like everyone who knows me and just to be like, trust me, like just put yeah. this in your pocket and wait 20 years. Yeah. Like, cause I, I think that we have a, a pretty cool opportunity and we're very good at like, we've built six uh, multi eight figure businesses in the last five years. So like we know this process. And so I just want to prove it out with like, 50 or hundred. And in terms of like the why, because like, I don't need the money, obviously. Um, like the mission of the company is to like rings true to my heart, which is just like, it's the document and share the best practices of building world-class companies. It's like what I love. Mm -hmm. It's like why I wrote the books, why I do the channel. So I make the courses. Like I just, 
I just love business. Yeah. Do you invest? It doesn't sound like you invest at all. It's, it seems like you have no index funds. You own no real estate. You're just like, why would I waste my time earning a measly 8% a year uh, when I could just buy another business? No, I, um, so actually you'd be surprised. Um, I have, I've probably a quarter of my cash in indexes. Um, I've got, uh, probably, do you mind talking numbers? Yeah, sure. Okay. I've got about 60 million bucks. Um, like that's not like equities in companies that are not like publicly traded. So like I would consider a, a commercial apartment building or a stock yes. stuff that people would accept as like money. Whereas like my equity in a company that's doing 30 million a year, what is it worth? It depends on the day. Right. Yeah, you know sure. what I mean? Um, so like that's what I have. And so like, it's basically split up between, um, indexes, um, <laughs> indexes, uh, real estate, just big multi. Um, buildings. I try and do like fewer. So like just a handful of like multi-million dollar like um, allocations. Cause like at some point, like it doesn't make sense to put like hundred million, sorry, hundred thousand dollar, like $250,000 allocations. Like it just, it's just, so too are you to investing in um, like, like syndicates for that money or you're doing it yourself? Well, I'll share something with ah, you. Cool. So um, I learned from a mentor um, who sold his company, which is in the real estate um, space for 3.6 billion. And I was like, Hey man, who is it? I I won't share because <laughs> okay. he doesn't want his numbers public. All right, all right um, that's fair. But anyways, he sold his real estate thing, um, and uh, I was like, "So what do you think I should do?" And he's like, "Well, with the," he's like, "The slugs that you're putting in," he's like, "You should just always have, you should always be participating in the GP." Um, and so for everyone who's watching, like you have your limited partners and you have your general partners. So limited partners normally will will contribute the majority of the capital. General partners will actually run the deal. And there's usually some sort of agreement between them in terms of the split. There's some sort of prefer, you know, preference or some sort of, you know, split in terms of after the fact, like there, there's a million ways to, to structure those agreements. And so he's like, well, if you're going to be putting up the money for these deals, and if you can do like a third or a half or more of the entire deal, he's like, you should just also get a corresponding percentage of the general partnership. And so like, we realized that. And then, you know, after talking to lots of different GPs, we're like, all right, what are the handful of people that we want to do business with that we like? And then we were just like, listen, we'll just fund all your deals. Like, just like when you see another, you know, $30 million building, I was like, we'll just fund it. Like, and then we'll just like, there won't be LPs. It'll just be us and we'll fund it. And we'll just have a simple arrangement. How do you do your taxes? I'm thinking of all of this thinking like, it's gotta be a stack of like that. It's not as complex as you'd think. Cause right. like all the stock stuff is like automatically generated. Right. Um, and then, you know, we don't, and because of like in the very beginning, Layla and I were like, all right, let's try and participate in these like real estate things. And I think we allocated like one and a half million dollars between like eight deals. And I was like, this is stupid. Let's not do this. <laughs> Cause like they would be like, Hey, can you sign? I was like, dude, like the fact that you asked me to sign this is not worth the time. Um, and so, uh, we stopped doing that and we were like, all right, what's our minimum allocation size? And it's like 5 million bucks. Those are the chunks that we're doing. And so like, if it's not that, I don't care. And so that's kind of like, what, and so now it's just like we have two or three operators that we work with that can that do that are doing deals in those sizes and so like when they come with a really good one then we're like yeah we'll do it we'll take it down or we're like we won't but That's it's, I do but that. they pre but they like pre-screen yeah. you know what I mean and and like the nice thing is that like when you're not on like the traditional LP you're not just like on their their list of 100 investors that they're going to go and try and get 50 to 100 grand from right, right? like you're just a, a nothing for us it's like dude if we take the whole deal down like make it good you know, like I'm making your life easier, make my life easier. Right. And so like everybody wins. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's what we do on that side. And then, um, and then I, I still have a big chunk in cash and, um, I'm just not that afraid of inflation. Okay. It's just not as big of a deal for me, mostly because I just own businesses. Yeah. So like I can adjust prices if I need to. And well, I like, think it just in terms of a percentage, it's like if, if 3% of your portfolio is in cash. It's oh no, it's like way higher than that. Even 5%. It's like way higher than that. 10? I don't know we're like 25 percent 25 percent oh oh wow so 25 percent of 60 million yeah but 15 wh million why is, is that just for to find deals as they come up yes okay um we i have considered actually putting it into like a dividend etf um and then just taking loans against it to fund the deals mm -hmm. it's something that i'm literally actively thinking about um i think there's just like peace of mind sure. um and as you probably just saw from my decision to sell three companies yeah. in one year and a house and two cars. Um, I sold everything last year. Um, literally all my material possessions. Um, why did you do that? I just wanted to clean slate. You know what I mean? Like every five years or so, I feel like I've like, I've had like three seasons. I had like my college and management consulting season. Um, I had my gym ownership season. I had my gym launch prestige labs, Allen season. And then like, this is like the season of acquisition.com. So it's like, 
it, it's always been in like that yeah. three to five year season range. And yeah. so like every time I end up usually just like cleaning the slate, how does, focus. How does your wife feel about that? About oh, like, she's fine. She doesn't care. Well, she works with me in the business. She's oh, co-CEO. Cool. cool. So we actually met, um, so our first date, I just pitched her on working for me. Cause I was like, listen, this might not. <laughs> How did you Jack, meet her? Do that. <laughs> yeah. Do that. Oh, I was like, this Jeez. might not work out. And I was Ugh. like, but like, like if you can, cause she could sell, she was the top salesperson for 24 hour fitness um, for all of our. Is that County. how you met her? Not, I met her through uh, Bumble, but. Dude, uh, no yeah. way. <laughs> met her through Bumble nice, and then cool. she told me she was the top sales rep. And I was like, like, if you can sell, we can make a ton of money together. And she was like, okay. And she was like, I want to learn how to market. And I was like, well, I just so happen to know how to do that. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. So I was like, I'm going to start this company called Gym Launch. And then she was like, whatever. And the next time she saw me, I was like, look, I got the bank accounts. I got the corporate. And she was like, oh shit, you're like really doing this. I was like, yeah, like, yes, <laughs> I'm doing it. Um, I was like, you should quit your job and join me. And she was like, I literally just met you. And I was like, yeah, you should totally quit your job and join me. Like, I'm going to go like fly around the country and launch these gyms. And she was like, uh, let me know how it goes. Mm -hmm. And so I launched the first three gyms, came back. Um, she picked me up from the airport. I hadn't taken her on a date yet. This is a funny story. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, uh, I was like, I will take you on this date. I promise as long as you do this one thing for me first. And she's like, what? I was like, you helped me process these contracts. And so I had this stack of contracts that was like this pie. And so I taught her how to process them. And we processed like 120 grand in, in like an hour. And she was like, what do you do again? And, she, and then, and she like, before I could even answer, she was like, is it legal? <laughs> <laughs> but you know for a fact when yeah. you're handing her a stack of contracts yeah. of 20, 120 grand you're like all right yeah come yeah. join now you see you and see so, these numbers and, and you see what we're doing yeah. you yeah. want to join did you start off as like employees first or was she your employee first and then it evolved or no, was it so we we were it was literally like same time mm -hmm. like we started dating and i was like you should quit your job and so like there was a lot of trust obviously you know what i mean and like and while i went to go launch these three gyms like i left and i was like hey here's my bank account and can you go pick up all the money at all my gyms and so she was like showing up as this girl that i'd only known for 10 days like with like a big bag where they would like put all the cash in and she'd be like thank you like a drug dealer like and she'd go to the next gym and like they just put all the cash in she was like do they not pay with check or like well so we had so anybody who bought physical products well people still use cash you know what i mean this was five years ago too um and so like we had a certain percentage of the sales that were, I didn't have a cash register because I didn't want to encourage cash it's theft and all that stuff. And yeah, so, sure. um, if someone paid in cash we had a little envelope system where they were like, what was it for the amount? And then they'd slide it in the safe and then we'd pick up the cash once a month. So what did you sell the other year? Like you said, you sold everything. Yeah. What was that? Like what it was a house. Cars? You said two cars. So I sold Allen, the software company, the strategic buyer, which okay. I can't disclose the price on that one. Okay. I sold so the, the supplement company, Prestige Labs. I sold Gym Launch. Um, I sold the majority shares of both of those, or all three of those. And then I sold my house in Austin, um, which was crazy. Um, it like doubled in value, which is cool. Um, so we what, sold since that. You, since you sold it? No, not since. So we bought it for 1.8. We sold it for four. Got it. Um, in, in three years, which mm -hmm. is cool. Um, and I bought that all cash, no mortgage. So I actually have zero debt, which is, mm. um, ironic. Uh, <laughs> everyone's like, that's all smart. And I'm like, I don't know, whatever. I'm, I might just be an idiot. It's very possible. Um, and so anyways, we, uh, sold that and then sold my cars. Uh, I had a Bentley, um, which I only bought because like I hadn't spent money on really anything expensive. Mm. And then people were like, dude, you should buy something expensive. And I was like, all right, I guess we'll like, we only had one car until like last year. What car was it? Uh, it was an I eight, which I got as a gift. Um, for being an affiliate of ClickFunnels. So they, they gave you an I8? Yeah. We sent them a lot of business. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Did, did, wow. Does Russell send you that like personally? Uh, basically, he's like, here's the list of cards you can get. And I was like, can I just get like, can I just get the money? And he was like, no, you have to get the car. And I was like, why is that for like marketing? Yeah. 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 It's like, so you got, you send him a picture and then like a video like, hey, ClickFunnels is great. And then, and then you get the car. So, um, wow. Yeah. So, so bought the I8. Um, ironically, couldn't even, uh, couldn't get a, a loan for the i8 and we we're doing like a million a month take home at the time you know what i mean couldn't get a loan Why? for it just no credit score i've never had debt okay i've like i've never had debt ever yeah so like i don't have a besides credit cards like which like, like business credit cards like we i have no i have no history of repayment i bought but my so house you have in no cash. per you have no personal credit card i have a personal credit card that gets paid off you know every month or whatever but like i have no like loan i don't have a mortgage yeah. i have nothing so I'm going to take, I think I'm going to try and take my first mortgage out of buying a house. So it'll be exciting. <laughs> why? Just to have a history with the mortgage? Um, oh, why am I taking the mortgage yeah. out? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think it makes like, that seems like low risk debt to me. You know, I was, um, I would say, uh, you know, a lot of people poo poo on Dave Ramsey. He, he introduced the concept of debt to me that I, that I thought was valuable, which is like debt 
increases risk. Risk expanded over a long enough time horizon can get you to zero. And my my tolerance for zero, like the, the marginal utility I have of more money is basically nothing. Mm-hmm. The, the, the marginal cost of me going to zero is very high. And so like I want to risk money, ri- I want to increase my risk to, to get more of something that I don't need and risk something that I do have that I do need. Mm-hmm. Like you just thought mm-hmm. about it like that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, and, I, and when I think about like, how, how am I going to become a billionaire? Um, cause right now, cause like I'm probably over like a hundred million if you like took the other 40 million from my equities of the other companies that I own. And so it's like, I just have to 10 X over the rest of my life. And so, but like, I don't think I'm going to get there through indexes. I mean, I could, if you put it 45 years out or whatever, sure. but, um, I think that it, like, it's the appreciation of equity, which is where I'm going to get it through these companies that become something big. Um, and so just realizing that that's actually where my wealth is going to be built. I just, everything in my life is built around just minimizing the amount of headspace that it takes up so I can put it in the vehicle that, that I get the yeah. highest return on. I wouldn't even get a mortgage. Why? Yeah, I would just pay it on, just continue doing what you're doing. Yeah. It's not even worth it. I think um, we might. I mean, like, I'm, yeah. I, it's it's a non-decision. Like, I don't, yeah. I, get, I don't have a lot of emotional investment in it. Okay. Yeah. Walk us through, through like a normal day. Like, what time do you get up? Because you said like you, you showed up here and you're like, no, I don't want coffee. I already had two coffees. Yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah. I told you, I was like, we should do it at night. And you're like, okay, sure. And I said, sure, seven thirty. Or I said something like that. And you're like, oh man, that's late. <laughs> I was like, you party on? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, like we usually get up at four or five. You know what I mean? Like I don't, we don't, we don't have an alarm clock. Uh, but we, I have like, I have a mental alarm clock for when I get exhausted and get sleepy. <laughs> what time is it? Yeah, like between nine and ten. Okay. Nine and ten, I'm usually going to bed. Okay. So I fall, you know, fall asleep at ten, wake up at four, at six hours, like it's fine. So if I need more sleep, I'll sleep till five. Like, have you always been a morning person? Since I did that thing with Sam, since I went from like waking up and, I mean, I've always been okay in the morning. Like I, I, I definitely now would be what I can't. Wor- I can't. Strong word. I, I don't work past like four. Mm. So I'm like a like I usually work from like four or five until like eleven. And that's when I get all my work done. And then from like 11 to three or four is when I do like meetings and stuff. And I've structured my day like that for a while and it works for me. What advice do you have for us? See, <laughs> I need to pick, I need to pick your brain on this. Yeah, I'm here. Let's rock. Give us advice. How do we make more money? More money? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have like you. an insane audience. And so I think it's just like figuring out what, what, vi- you know, I was talking to, um, uh, Mr. Beast, uh, and he was, like, and I, I still have this recommendation. So if you do, mm-hmm. if you are watching this, I'd still stand by what I said, which is I feel like he should have um, an energy drink called like beast mode or something. And I was like every single, like it's because it had to be something that like kids could consume. It had to be something that was mass market. It had to be something that had good repeat purchase. It had to be something that had good gross margins. And I was like, so I thought about it for a while. Cause we were, we were talking about stuff. Um, and I feel like, I feel like he should have that for his channel. And so I feel, I, I use that as an example of like, I think that there has to be something that that within your audience would be really awesome. That would be a good vehicle. Like, um, I know you know Grant Cardone, right? Like, mm-hmm. he's been able to build you know a billion dollars worth of equity because he used a better vehicle than all the YouTubers. But he doesn't have like more reach than YouTubers. He has a better vehicle. Mm-hmm. And so I think that it's it's that. It's like I think the vehicle that most of them are, like the ad revenue and like course sales are like meh. Like who cares? I yeah. mean, like there's yeah. nothing wrong with it, but like there's there's better ways to skin the cat. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really um, figuring out what high leverage play you can make there. So that's where like fund vehicles or high leverage plays, you know what I mean? Like anything that's investment related is always a high, higher leverage play. And it's like, well, I don't know what I would necessarily invest in. It's like, well then go acquire that skill or go find the guy who has that skill, bring them in, cut them a piece and then be like, cool, here's this guy. He's awesome. Like I'm putting all my money with this cause X, Y, Z and you can too or whatever. Yeah. Um, obviously there's regulatory and all that stuff, but like you can do it legit. There's nothing different about that versus, you know, a guy on wall street doing the same thing. He's just like calling friends and family and calling lists from trust funds. You know what I mean? And you would just be hitting your own audience, which gives you your own upside. You mentioned Grant Cardone. I noticed that you posted this one video. I paid yeah. Grant Cardone. It was $120,000. Yeah. Or over it was 130, I think. $130,000 yeah. over like, what was it? It said 120. I actually now remember, I think it was 130, but yeah. Got it. Yeah. And that was over what? Like four sessions? Or yeah, so like my that? wife got me a Christmas gift as a surprise. Yeah, and so she was like, "What can I get, Alex?" And so she like called um, Grant's office up and was like, "I want to pay." Christmas f- gift? Yeah, one hundred twenty thousand. One hundred twenty thousand yeah. dollars Christmas. I know she skimped this year. I'm like really upset about it. Um, I don't know. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh I'm totally kidding. 
<laughs> Magic card. No, nah, just give me the money. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> think impressive. so, right? But, but like, like well, no, do you guys have joint accounts? We need the picture. Yeah. I mean, I I don't. I've never logged into our account, so I don't. I could all this money I could be making up. I have no idea. Like, and I mean, in terms of, I, I'm not making it up, but I'm saying like, right? Like you just don't my, check it. Yeah, she'd manage all stuff. I don't. Do you know, okay? So when you're purchasing it, I mean, how often would you say you purchase things? I mean, daily. And do you ever like think when you swipe? No. It's no. just like, oh, okay, I think I need it. I kind of want it. I just, I've always been curious about that. So if you guys share an account and she buys the $120,000, is that yeah. gift kind of like you both are paying for it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's not like yeah. Her, her money, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. she's like, I was hustling on the side on OnlyFans just yeah. for you. Like, yeah. It's like, I'd rather you just not do that. Yeah. No, but she, I mean, no, she, yeah, she co-owns everything with me. You know what I mean? So she, she's half the money is all hers anyways. Wait, um, what did you get her? Wait, that was for Christmas? Yeah. What'd you get her? Um, actually something pretty cool. Um, I told her, I was like, this is my best present for five years. Like, you just got to give me credit next year too. Um, so I got her this, uh, this, there was like a whole presentation behind it, um, which my assistant helped me with. Um, but, uh, got this uh, photo book that had like all these pictures in it from like the early days until now, like hundreds. It was like really well done. And then it was like, Hey, we've made lots of memories together. Maybe we should make some more. And so got like, uh, the lady who does the photography sessions for Vogue, mm -hmm. um, to do like a joint, like we need more headshots and stuff. It's been like four years since we've done the last one. So I was like, Let, maybe I'll make a thing of something that would be a business expense. Um, and so we're going to do like a full day, like, uh, like photo shoot for like, you know, it's new season, new, new, all my stuff's like gym stuff. So it's like mm. new season, new pictures. So that was the gift. It sounds lamer now that I'm describing it to you, but like, <laughs> but it no, was, it's it cool. The cool. Vogue yeah. photographer yeah, yeah. It's nice. Yeah, it was yeah. cool. And there was like some stuff around it, but yeah, that wow. was, uh, that was what, but anyway, so that she got me that yeah. because like, what do you get somebody who, like it's so like money has very very little marginal utility right like there's once you have enough there's there, the added value is very low right and so i was like well like for me everything i always value is like if i can get education or some sort of skill or belief that needs to be broken like that's all that i try and spend my money on it's the highest and like is the best thing that i've gotten honestly in, in, a, in a long time um and so she called them up and they were like you can't do that. And she was like, just name a number. I'll do it. And then they was like, I'm not sure I'm going to have to call you back. And then the guy hung up and she was like, I thought this was a sales organization. <laughs> She's yeah. like, I'm here. He's like, I will pay you whatever you want. And so anyways, the manager called back and was like, you will be dealing with me directly. Forget about that guy. <laughs> um, and he's like, we can absolutely facilitate this. Um, and so I think it was 30,000 a call or something like that. How long were the calls? Um, an hour ish. So, um, would you say you got a hundred and thirty yeah, thousand dollars worth of value out of that? So easily. explain the call. So like, how does the first call go? Have you and, met him yet at this point? Not in person. I mean, we met on zoom. So you had spoke to him previously. The, the first call I had with Grant was a zoom call. Oh, that was this. the first time you've ever yeah, spoken to yeah, him. Yeah, in per exactly. Okay, right, but no, uh, wouldn't you think, uh, and when was this actually, uh, about a year ago, I still haven't used all the calls. Got it. Okay. I've done two right. calls. I would so just far. think at, at your level, even a year ago, that you would have access to Grant Cardone without the. Maybe. I mean, yeah. he's pretty busy. Okay. You know what I mean? And like, I'm, I don't, like, I'm, I'm no one from like, a, like, I, you know what I mean? And like a year ago, I didn't have an audience. I started making yeah, sure. YouTube stuff a year ago. So okay. like, okay. All that's new. Sure. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I didn't have anything to offer besides money. So I was it. like, I will, I would happily pay you for time. So what, what happened in the first call? Um, I said, you know, these are the four kind of areas that I'm looking at and I'd like your context. And one of the things that's unique about Grant is that like, he's, 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 he's followed a similar trajectory. Obviously, you know, he does his own vibe. He does his own thing. But like, in terms of like actual doing this, like he was a car sales guy and then he started teaching car sales and then he went broader and started teaching sales. Um, and then he transitioned to marketing briefly. Uh, and then he transitioned to real estate, which has been the main thing now. Um, and so with each of those kind of iterations, uh, he's grown bigger and wider, uh, in terms of what he's done. And so I was like, okay, you know, I was a gym guy and then I started teaching gyms and I started going more general. And so like, there's a similar path mm -hmm. there. And he also has a, I think a good dynamic with Elena that I was like, I think that's cool. I think they mm -hmm. have a good thing going there, which I, which most people don't. Um, so I was like, okay, I would like to understand the fame machine is like my bullets. So I was like, I'd like to understand the fame machine. I wanted to understand more about has, how his actual businesses functioned. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to understand the wealth machine in terms of how he sees it. Um, and there was a fourth one. I can't remember, but I did have four and those are the, I mean, obviously I guess those are the, the ones that I care about most now, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I, I, 
I asked him for context on the income thing, which actually did help give direction for acquisition.com. Hmm. So for me, like, did I make the under twenty thousand dollars back like in five seconds? You know what I mean? And I think one of the things with like people see the prices, but like I think it's understanding like relative income and also relative to upside, which is like for for context, it's like if you make ten million dollars a year, right? It's like I'm making twenty times more than the average American household, right? Is that 10 million or 200, 200. times? 200. 50, there it is. 50K, yeah. yeah. So, um, so 200 times more <laughs> than the 50K. So take whatever price something costs and divide it by 200. And that's the relative cost. And so it's like, okay, I can't believe you go out to $200 dinners every night. I'm like, well, it cost me a dollar. Would you go out to a five star dinner for cost you a dollar? Sure. Well, then that's why we do it. You know what I mean? Like, and uh, like, would you pay this $120,000 if it cost you whatever that is, but divided by 200, right? Less. Yeah, you know whatever that is, it was six hundred bucks mm -hmm. to talk to Grant or seven eight hundred bucks to talk to Grant Cardone. Yes, I would do that absolutely. And so that's why we we do that. And then relative to upside is like I like only way that I like people are like oh, I wish I could have access to Bill Gates, right? Yeah, one hundred and fifty dollars to talk to Grant Cardone. Right, yeah. so it makes sense. But like to talk to um to Bill Gates, right? It's like there's nothing that Bill Gates can tell me. I don't think at this point that I could ever get what it would what it would cost me to pay him for his time. Like I have to be bigger in order to have enough leverage to use whatever he would give me. So like if I'm at like a billion and he's at a hundred billion, he's a hundred times bigger than me, but like he could give me something that for the relative small amount of time to pay him, I could get enough leverage to go from 1 billion to 10 billion. Like that's reasonable. But if you're at like a hundred thousand dollars, you don't, you don't, there's no lever you can pull on. Right, that's gonna make un, make up the delta, and so it's like I'm a big believer in like try and go two steps ahead, but like ten steps ahead that's just smart. makes no yeah yeah it makes no difference. You know what I mean? Like they're so far like <clears throat> the cost because we're like I should pay Grant Cardone. You're like I'm like dude, you're a sales guy. There's nothing he can tell you besides like save your money. Which there you go. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, right. You're like for me, I had things that I I was like I've got these three portfolio companies. This is what I'm doing with my money. I'm you know and like when I was thinking about doing the sale, I talked to him about that. I was like, what do you think about this and you know, he, he basically said like, don't, don't sell if it's financial. He's like, but there are other reasons to sell, which if you don't want to own it anymore, you want to do something else, then, then, then do it. You know what I mean? But it's not from, from a financial standpoint, it doesn't make sense. And so we were in agreement on that, but I mm -hmm. ended up pulling the trigger for other reasons. How many calls have you done with them so far? Two. Okay. I did a podcast, which has got what got aired. That actually wasn't a coaching call. That was a podcast for like the community. But, um, so I've done three calls technically, but two of them were coaching calls and the two calls that were coaching calls were not aired. Not because I didn't want to, but he, they weren't recorded for whatever mm. reason. There's like a tech malfunction. It's yeah. funny that you paid $40,000 or whatever it was yeah. per call, 30,000. 30. And, uh, and then you held on to like the tickets that you have, like the coupons or whatever for the calls. What if you held on for like 10 years yeah. and grant is then worth, you know, like billions of dollars or something yeah. like that, right, right? Then you can, yeah. can you still use this? Yeah. Probably. That's funny. I mean, Grant, Grant, so as much as like a lot of people talk a lot of crap about Grant, but like haven't met Grant, um, he was incredibly respectful. He's super attentive. He like writes notes during the calls. He like pays attention, like, and he genuinely came from a place of trying to help. And so like, I have, I have nothing but, you know, respect and he's been nothing but helpful for me. You were telling uh, uh, me something earlier about the mustache as yeah. far as branding is concerned. That's why I mentioned Jack shaved the mustache. I shaved my mustache. I got to say, yeah. I'm not a fan of the mustache personally. Oh, I thought you were going to say that you're right. now like realizing <laughs> that it was good for me to no, have a mustache because it looks in naked. Your, in your podcast, the My First Million that you yeah. did, you're talking about personal branding. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain this? Because I do think it's really interesting and I, and I do think that, uh, uh, Jack, you should probably hear this and I'm, I'm going in with an open mind. I just don't understand why you get rid of so much raw masculinity in one foul swoop. You know, you're like, I'm not a fan of the stash. It's like, I'm not a fan of the feminine face. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, but, uh, but on the, on the show, I read a book by Dan Kennedy and I think in some paragraph somewhere, he was like, people who have recognizable facial features are, um, are more easily remembered. Um, and so it helps for branding and things like that. And so I was like, okay. And, um, I fell into the mustache. It wasn't supposed to be like the stash. I had that in the back of my mind. Um, but I ended up just doing a porn stash for my first event because I was like so nervous to like, I was like, what if I tank or what if they, no one likes me or whatever. And so I was, I did that to like, look at myself in the mirror and be like, you will survive. You have a porn stash. Like 
this is all a joke and it's all going to be okay. <laughs> and so anyways, I got out and I think the event really went really well. And like two thirds of the dudes the next week all had porn stashes who came to the event. <laughs> and so, so like, it just like instantly just became a thing. And so then I was like, I guess I can't shave this. And so five years later, like I didn't shave it pretty much until, um, until COVID hit. And then I was just like burnt out, um, at that point, but, um, I'll probably bring the stash back at some point, but now I have a beard. So, yeah. but you were telling me, uh, what was it? A buddy in college yes. right? also had a mustache. Uh, so he, right? well, yeah. he was dipping. That was his issue. So, um, I'll, t I'll what, tell you, what, yeah. What's dipping? Uh, really? Oh, like yeah. putting like tobacco in your lip, like. Dip. Oh, yeah, like the baseball yeah. players. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So there's chewing tobacco and then there's like dip, which is like smaller pouches yeah. and stuff or dirt. Um, but anyways, I was in college. I was a pledge. And this guy that I was driving home, because that's what you do when your pledge is drive, you know, drunk brothers home mm -hmm. with the girls that they have in the back. Um, and uh, and this girl was with this guy who was like notorious for like always pulling the hottest girls and all this stuff. And he was like a senior. And uh, and he was still dipping while this girl was like, while, while he was like making out with this girl. Like he still had tobacco in his bath. It's still like, with it. and she was like, ah, dip is so disgusting. Um, and he was like, pledge. He was like, life lesson, listen. And I was like, oh God, because either he's like going to haze me or something or, you know, and he was like, she's more attracted to the fact that I don't give a shit about what she thinks than she's disgusted by the dip in my mouth. And I... <laughs> which was ridiculous, but also probably true. And so I think, um, I think the stash is a lot like that, which is like, because I think you asked me like, how does your wife feel about the stash? Yeah. It's like, I think at the end of the day, like she would care, she'd be more attracted to me being me than she would be unattracted by a choice of haircut. If I was not being me to have a more quote attractive haircut, that would be a far bigger turnoff than, mm. than me just being me. I think that's very true. That was, that was my, that was my porn stash and dipping, uh, <laughs> life lesson. I just experience. thought that was really interesting, <laughs> but from like a, a brand standpoint. So. <laughs> well, I actually had to, uh, yeah. license out likeness for the stash, uh, in the sale of the business. So it was definitely a thing enough that yeah. it was like, had to be listed as a line item on intellectual right. property. So is the beard intentional too for no, for, no, I just happened to have one and I like, it was like scruff. They got too yeah. long and then it was like, keep it. And I was like, All right. it seems you know, like you're yeah. going for kind of a look though. Like, like, uh, like, uh, like, like you just came the out of the jack. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. no, it's a lumberjack. Look. You look like, like Hugh Jackman. Dude, they're yeah, so you look like him. Oh These are yeah. so comfortable. Look, this is stretchy. I know. Well, I know because there's no way to get your biceps through they're like amazing. a normal non-stretchy <laughs> flannel. Look, but no, they're insane. Like, I've been looking at them the whole time, man. Yeah, they're insane. Oh yeah, man. We're gonna. We're no. Gonna go. Oh my. Oh yeah, we're going. Dude, we're going hit. all the way, man. We're going all the way. I gotta yeah. hit the gym right after this. No, me too. <laughs> Seriously, do you want to go to the gym now? Anyways, uh, wow. It wasn't really so. So I've been consistently just always trying to optimize off function, and so like these shirts are super comfortable. But I also have like four temperatures because like right now I'm a little hot, <laughs> um, and so like. So there's four temperatures with the shirt. And I yeah. actually stopped wearing t-shirts because like beaters are awesome. And so I just like recently yeah. discovered these and I was like, I will wear these forever. I think you should How do How much that. are they? Yeah. Beaters? Like five cents. These are nothing. Oh, you're talking about the beater. I thought you were talking about the- Oh, the, the flannels. flannels. These are actually really expensive. Yeah. I'm kind of embarrassed by expensive. I'm guessing they're probably 250, 300 bucks. What? They're like one, yeah, they're like 200 bucks. Yeah. I thought that, that looks like you got it from Costco. every time and get, yeah. like, and get like 30, 40 bucks off. Yeah. Oh, you should be getting this for free. I probably should. Yeah. But I'm not good at the influencer game. You know so. what you should do is a, a handlebar mustache. I well, think, that's what I yeah. that's what I kind of had for. Yeah. It was like gunslinger. Oh. Yeah, but I think go all the way down. All the way. Yeah, to the I, neck. Could. yeah. I could. I <laughs> 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 just connected the chest hair yeah, and just chest. all the way yeah. down. Um, but yeah, so this yeah. is cool because I, if I if it gets cold, I can button up and then I can roll the sleeves down. Yeah. If it gets a little warmer, I can roll the sleeves up and keep it buttoned. I can open it and keep the sleeves rolled, or I can keep it open and roll the sleeves yeah. down. So I have four different temperature settings and I can take it off. So like I have tons of temperature adjustment with one setting. And with this, <laughs> I have the beater and I've got like basically Hawaiian shirts and I've got flannels. So it's like when it's summer, I'll switch to Hawaiians and it's winter and I'll have flannels and I can just have beater as the base and I'll have I any t-shirts. I feel like you need an affiliate link. Like you gotta buy a minority stake in this This I probably company. should. Yeah. I have, a I literally have all of the colors of this shirt. Oh my gosh. <laughs> now. <laughs> Jack, do you want to tell them about your walk? Do you want to mention that? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right. This is also something I've, I haven't told you. So, basically, I planned on I, I planned on walking from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. Basically. Okay. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Actually? Yeah. yeah. That's insane. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and basically, I, I talked with Grim about it. I kind of wanted to make a video around it. I walked this amount of X miles, yeah. 300 miles for a Tinder date. Force that, comes that. That was okay. the, the plan of the video. 
And then I spoke with Graham about it and Graham was like, you know, it's not really different if you walk 300 versus 100, at least like for yeah. the audience. And 100 might even look better than 300. And I was like, well, makes sense. It's a lot less walking too. Mm -hmm. uh, I just figured Los Angeles to Las Vegas because it's like, I drive that all the time. And I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, why not? It's, it sounds kind of fun. Uh, so I might actually now just walk 100 miles. It still sounds terrible. Really? I mean, it's a lot. Of, I mean, that's like yeah. four marathons. Well, here's my thought. Five. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's St. George, so it, it, it'd be yeah. 120. It sounds good to say I walked from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. Yeah. Does it really? It does. Yeah. But your title was I walked 300 miles for a right. Tinder date. Terrible, right. And so I thought between 300 and 100, 100, people can conceptualize 100 more than they can 300. Just like we yeah. say how it's to a make lot. $100 a day in passive income. We never say how to make $300 a day, even though that's three times more. See, I figured I walked to Los Angeles. Las Vegas from Los Angeles is not that great of a title because it's like it's restricting your audience because you have oh, people only that have West Coasters to know, know the that difference. Is. That's true. The distance between you know yeah. LA and in Las Vegas. But if you say I walked this amount of miles for a yeah. Tinder date, then it's universal. Oh, no. What about no. you said hours? If you like, I walked for no, no. Here's, how you, here's how you do it. I walked from Los Angeles to Las Vegas would be your title, and the thumbnail would show 300 miles. Boom. That I was going to do a, a Matthew Beam type thumbnail, like day six. And it's me like, like this. And like, I have like the crazy, you know, eye bags and stuff like that. And you could do that. Like, like just Wilson on, on the title. On yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But the thing is that if you don't walk all the way and you want something like to walk into a Tinder date, then yeah. that gives an alternative title. So yeah. for Tinder date, I think it's a hundred miles. I think Tinder date's probably the way to go. I think that's pretty clickable, but I'm planning on doing that. And I think... We're going to leave for St. George now. Instead, in Utah, it's 120 miles. So you have to find a date I there. don't know, man. I think you well, uh, you sold yourself short there. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about, Alex? Like, <laughs> what, that's it? That's it? That's all you're going to say? You're I not, mean... You're going to say you, anything else? You hyped up this whole... While. You've been telling Graham and I, oh, I'm going to walk to... Yeah, to, but Alex, but every single... You're like, hold on. But before this video idea, the whole reason you told us that you wanted to do this walk was, you know, you were so passionate about it, you wanted to do it. And then all of a sudden now it's like, oh, well, now I'm doing a video. And then now it's like, well, you know, 100 miles does seem better clickable. So now I'm just going to walk <laughs> no, 100 Alex, miles. You know what it was? You know what it was? Shifted from a personal adventure to a YouTube video. Mm. And Thank you. For well, if I'm going to do it, it makes sense to do it for Are a you. Are you letting the YouTube t tail wag the life accomplishment dog? Oh. I, it's a hard an analogy for me to understand, but I'm assuming no. Is the tail wagging the dog? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think so. No, it's not. But here's the thing, man. I brought this walk up to you guys, and you guys shot it down, and you kept saying it's stupid, it's dumb, it's idiotic, you should not be doing this. And I'm like, and now all of a sudden, when I change the the, the range, so it's not 300, it's 120, you guys are like, oh, no, it's a, you know, you're doing it for the, the whale when, tagging. Yeah, so tail wagging. When, <laughs> when Jack brought this idea to me, he was filming. He was filming, and uh, I was critical of the idea, because we, and we we were both filming so like i was yeah. filming for the vlog and jag was jack was filming for his channel telling me about this idea and i'm thinking well you know if you look at the value of your time what are you going to get from this what is this going to do for you and i was like we should use that time to get more sponsors and like that was like we have you, every episode is completely filled with sponsors but we could do more we, we could, can, I, I don't <laughs> want to put in more sponsors it's, i just thought there were, there were other things like from a utility point of view and then he was explaining it's not utility point it's it's a personal thing that he wants to do for himself that would help his personal growth and it's like more, it's a, it's a lot of things yeah and then i was like okay well then you know well then you, you just got to do it what but if you just it, did it and didn't youtube it I would do that, but I, the thing is, <laughs> but, I, yeah. I don't think it's smart to just take two weeks off to do this walk. And also, I've been training recently for this walk a little yeah. bit, 10 mile days, and it kills my legs. My legs are toast. Wait, after so, you 10 don't, miles. so you don't walk smart to take two weeks off yeah, for but it's a hard. Walk. <laughs> so here's the thing. <laughs> it's hard, man. Jack, like, I had yeah. to ice bath my legs. <laughs> oh, my God. Jack explained this to me, like, because I was like, Jack, how are you going to take like 10 days off? What about so like a podcast episode comes up? Like what's going to happen? And Jack explained to me, well, you know, it's no different than me going on a vacation for a week or two. And it's like you wouldn't say this at, if I went to the Bahamas for a while. I was like, OK, you know what? You're right. Uh, but but now but now Jack's saying, well, it's, you know, he doesn't want to. Graham, <laughs> this is so silly because yeah. I went and I got dinner with Graham and Graham spent yeah. probably 20 minutes trying to convince me to walk 100 miles instead of 300. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden when I say, you know what, Graham, I think that's a good <laughs> idea. No, Jack, you should go back to doing 300 <laughs> no, miles and reason, take you more time off. The reason why was because uh, it sounded like you wanted to optimize for a YouTube video. 
And between the two, as a YouTube title, I think 100 miles is easier to conceptualize. Yeah, and also so, I'm getting yes. the same experience. Like I'm walking t a marathon a day for, f what would that be, five days? Maybe a little bit less for six days. Camping in a tent on the side of the road, it's still gonna be the same content. It's still gonna be yeah. the same experience. You know what I mean? Like personal growth and everything. Yeah. I don't know. Just keep telling yourself. Yeah. What, well, do, you <laughs> what, do, you, what do you think? You're you're a neutral third. <laughs> yeah. You have a lot of experience in this. I think you just. Gotta, <laughs> he has a lot of experience. Yeah. Of experience. yeah. <laughs> I think so. I have a I have a, a big personal thing which is like no half measures, and so wow. a lot of times we <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> we we compromise on the goal and try and mix two priorities. So it's like either I'm buying my dream house or I'm buying a good investment. And a lot of times people are like, well, I'm going to try and buy my dream house, but also make sure it's a good investment. And you end up with a mediocre investment and not your dream house. So it's like, you have to just figure out like, is this something I'm doing for me? Or is this something I'm doing for YouTube? If you're doing it for YouTube, then just make it for YouTube and accept it. Or you're like, I'm doing it for me, period. Wow. That's good. I, that actually. was well I agree with that. Wow. Oh, if it's man, YouTube, I think a hundred miles Tinder date, optimize for that and make a great video out of it. And then you can still do the 300 for yourself if you want to. I also thought it would be somewhat idiotic to walk 300 miles after only walking 10 miles two times. <laughs> <laughs> I told Jack Just to, to be train, you were like 30 times so, this. <laughs> I told Jack to train, try to get like 25 miles a day because that's how long. We were supposed to do that yesterday, but Apple was like, oh, I have too much work. And that's the guy I'm doing it with. <laughs> so we oh didn't do gosh. it. Oh my gosh. And I wanted to. You know, 10 miles a day would take you 30 days. I know. <laughs> That's insanity. So I, and the thing is, it's like, I, I could damage my body <laughs> doing that. And I don't want to do that. Why don't you just bike? Because, man, I like, well, I, I do really like walking. And a part of it is, like, I just want to walk and just walk for as long as I can. You know what you should that have just sounds great. do the 300 yeah. miles. <laughs> no, you walk, like, 10 miles for a Tinder date and then just be exhausted when you get there. That's the thing. I'm going to walk straight into the date. Well, I'm saying like, just, just, just 10 miles, like just walk the whole day and then go. On no, because I, I want to walk for multiple days. Like that, that is a desire of mine. I want to ask you this. Uh, so here's, here's my question to you. I've had a really difficult time scaling mm -hmm. uh, because everything Business? is, just, yes. Okay. I would say the, the entire Graham Stephan brand, um, I would say brought on Jack we scaled through the iced coffee hour. There's been a few other things here and there, but I would say the iced coffee hour is the only one that really hit. Um, but I find myself no more productive. Uh, we got Alex on now. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting any more work done. I'm not getting any extra content done. Um, obviously, we, we could go to two times a week on the podcast. That's something I know we could probably double growth on the podcast by doing two times a week. Um, I'm kind of tapped out on what I could do mm -hmm. because I can't make more videos in the main channel. So yeah. like the main channel is optimized. Yeah. Um, I've been starting to outsource some of the editing with Alex. I'm mm -hmm. not getting any extra work done because it's not, not like I could get an extra video done on the main channel. Some of that's new. What's the objective? Uh, I would say both longevity because I really enjoy it, but I mm -hmm. also don't like just feeling like I'm in the same place or like doing the same things repetitively. I'll ask you a better question. Yeah. So you said we're having trouble scaling. Scaling yeah. what? Scaling influence, scaling money, scaling income, scaling, Probably like what are we scaling? all of it. Probably all of it. Cause I like it. Graham. It's money. Well, okay, so for, so for <laughs> well, wait, wait. don't just Here's give them a straight yeah. answer, it's man. Not, but it's not just that, but it's like for, for scaling, for scaling money, I know it's sponsorships. It's getting more sponsorships. Is and, it and No, I it's not. Sponsorships. It's not sponsorships. I just don't want to feel, well, I would say money, money is a component of it, but I wouldn't say it's the entire thing. Do you want to be a business guy or do you want to be a media guy? It's a genuine question. I don't like have a dog in the fight. I don't know. I like the media aspect of it, but I'm worried of how fickle it is totally. that, uh, you know, it's, it's way riskier to do that. And so part of me would like to maybe over 10, 15 years scale back on that and be more of a business person than, than a media person. But right now I know I've got a unique media mm -hmm. opportunity here that I don't want to, I don't want to waste it, but I also know like how easy it is to, you know, I've seen just what could happen with a cancel culture or mm -hmm. you don't even do anything, but you get yeah. accused of something and, and then your brand is kind of tarnished. And I've had so much writing on just like a clean image. Mm -hmm. Scaling media, you have this unique opportunity right now. You don't want to waste it because something could happen because you have a clean image. Right. So in my, my, my opinion is that you have like, my opinion is that 
unless you monetize it in some way, and it doesn't have to be now, but like as long as there's some sort of plan to do so, mm -hmm. then it then it isn't wasted. Because like if you have monetized it, then it's like, cool, this thing happened and like I've set myself up for life, that's done. Um, and then you can just continue to play the media game or because like right now, like if I had your size audience, like, I mean, I would have a billion dollar thing. Um, and so like, I feel like you're working on something that's not the constraint of the system. You're like, I need more eyeballs, but like you don't need more eyeballs. You need mm -hmm. more monetization of the eyeballs you have. I guess my problem is that I feel like I'm so good at the media aspect of sure. it that anything that diverts my attention away from that kind of kills what I mm -hmm. have going for me. Fair. I just see the world through a business lens. And so like, I'm like, man, just attach a business to this gigantic media machine that you have here. Um, I mean, you could just do the media play. I mean, I still think that like the easiest types of businesses are the the rock, you know, tequila or like McGregor tequila or Kylie tequila. Actually, they're all doing or, you know, what's his name? McGregor's doing whiskey. But like it's that's why I said the beast thing with the with the, yeah. the the soda. It's like what's an operationally simple business that you can do a partnership with well, somebody and then you push the yeah. traffic and it makes sense. I have the coffee brand bankroll, okay. but uh, our margins are so slim Yeah, and uh, it's a good business. It's yeah. just, everything's reinvested. Yeah. I don't make anything myself. Yeah. And I don't know how long-term to make money without either raising prices, Yeah, uh, in which case we might upset some of our customer base, but probably not the end of the world, yeah. <clears throat> or eventually partnering or selling a portion of that to a, a much larger established company. It seems like those are the only two outlets on that. But I started it really just for fun. Yeah. So So I think rather than starting it necessarily for fun, it would be like looking at a number of different, like the thing with the, the soda thing, it's like the cost on making a soda is very low, which is why Coca-Cola is still here because they make so much money. Um, like their gross margins are amazing. And so it's like, I think I like, I only want to get into a product and if I can sell it for like usually at least five to 10 times what it costs, like, mm -hmm. or I'm just not interested. It's just too, it's just too difficult um, for me. And that's probably because I'm going to be an idiot. So like, I just want things to be easier if I can, like we get to choose, so we might as well choose the easier thing. Yeah. Um, and so like, I think that the simplest business, like media, selling media, cause you make media is very simple cause it's sponsorships, but like the people who are buying your sponsorships are getting 10 times their money or more from the sponsorship, which is mm -hmm. why they continue to buy them. So it's like, well, what is everyone else selling on my channel? And which of these things could I also just do myself? Like that would be like maybe the first thing I would look at. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, um, or like, creating some partnerships like and you're doing the sponsorship deals but it might also just be valuable to say like i don't want money like give me equity in the company and i'll and i'll push the traffic so it's it very difficult to do that i, yeah. I believe it but yeah. you're you and you can just choose to say like it's kind of like the gp thing with the real estate people are like you, you just ask for it and i'm like i just don't do deals unless it's this and so i think you can just draw a new line and say like from here on forward like the graham stephan show just like i'm not promoting anyone that i don't have equity in period. So if you want to be on the show, then yeah, I, I tried that for all of 2020. Mm -hmm. And there was only one company that agreed to equity. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, the other companies that agreed to equity were terrible companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the ones who are like, Oh, yeah, no, we'd, we'd rather sure. do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give that away. Yeah. Um, but I found that either they're overpriced, they want some crazy high number or oh, like valuation for yeah, them. crazy valuations where it's like, well, there's all the upside, I'm paying a premium for that. I'm not going to do that. Um, or they're just crappy business. All the good businesses that I've seen guard that so heavily. Like they never want to give up equity. Like that's their bread and butter. Mm -hmm. And uh, they know their potential. They know their 10x. Mm -hmm. So. I have so many thoughts. But, okay, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. um, but like, so I mean, it's either like I am a media company. That's all I want to do. I'm going to stay in my lane. It's like, like either way that that business component has to get looped in. Yeah. So it's either you partner with somebody or you build the simplest business possible. So I know you have, I think you have a teachable thing. Um, yeah, I do. Uh, so it's like, you could do more stuff like that. You could do a higher version of that, which, you know, but that it creates a business. So it's like, you might want to just bring somebody in who is a businessy guy. If you want to just keep focusing on what you like doing, or you could learn that game, which I think my opinion is that like everyone who stays in the game long enough, like everyone does kind of meet in the middle. Like, I feel like you've come from like the personal finance savings, investing side, mm -hmm. Um, but like the more complex and the more your assets grow, like, I feel like you'll con like you continue to start walking more and more towards the value creation, buying, marketing, selling, you know, like running, operating a business. Yeah. So that's just, I've come from this world and walked this way. I think you're from this world, walk this way, but I think yeah. you do end up in the middle out of necessity. Like you have to know how to allocate capital and you have to know how to get a return on the capital. Yeah. The only thing I could think of, uh, is, is working a real estate syndicate, similar to what yeah. Grant Cardone does. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
That yeah. makes a ton of sense yeah. to me. I think a lot of people would trust you to do that. And um, you can either do it yourself or just say like, it's me and I am the fund raise. Like it's, it's really typical in a fund to have three parties. Like you've got the guy who does the money, mm -hmm. the guy who does the actual investing. And then the guy who like operates the, the fund. Yeah. Like those are like kind of the, typically the three roles, the guy who does the thing, the guy who gets the money and the guy who runs the little shop. Right. And so, I mean, you could sometimes have two you know, in that instance, but like, I think just getting the partner who goes and like operates all of the, um, the, the, the units or whatever you're, you're buying yeah. and then you raise the money. I think those are really good partnerships and that would make a ton of sense for you. Yeah. Any other advice that you have in terms of, uh, like productivity or getting more accomplished? Because I feel like, you know, I could bring five more people on the team, but I wouldn't get any more done. I think it's, so I'm a big believer in the theory of constraints, which is like, it's kind of like you getting more media, like the constraint on all the scaling stuff is not the media. You have more media than like anyone. So like you're working on the wrong side of the bridge. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like the reason it's my belief that we've been able to move quickly, you know, professionally, I'll use quotes here, like quickly, um, because it's like only focusing on what is the thing that is, is stopping us from getting to the next level and then ruthlessly working on that thing until it is de bottlenecked. And so it's like having the awareness to say, okay, I have this thing. Um, I could do more of this, but it's, being pushed through a pinhole. Like, so I can just try and get more water. It's like, or I can just expand the pinhole. And so I think that right now, like the pinhole is the opportunity vehicle that you're, you're working off of. Mm -hmm. AdSense is not an efficient vehicle. Teachable is okay, but like, it would be way better if you had like a sales team and a phone system and like you had an actual, like you would ten, like you would go to a million a month, like two seconds, like yeah. li one second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you'd be at a million a month, probably two million a month or three million a month if you had like chops around doing that. Um, like seriously, um, yeah. or, I, you know, um, the syndication thing, given just given what I'm like the very limited amount that I have met. So take this with a gigantic Himalayan grain of salt. Um, I think the syndication play makes a ton of sense because you just get to still be pretty much in the position that you're at in terms of like your day to day. It's just mm -hmm. like make stuff that people like and find value in, um, let people invest with me cause they're probably already asking to, I would imagine. Yeah. And then find somebody who does that full time and has been doing it for 20 years and then just like, and that's it. And then you just participate really like very well cause you can build it yourself and you're not asking for equity, you're building equity. Mm. I mean, that would be the easiest way for you to just like go to a hundred million and like skip all these in between steps. Yeah. Definitely good food for thought. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Otherwise you have to build a business, yeah. which is then like, you can either sell a service or you can sell a product. And so I don't think you'd want to sell a service because it's difficult yeah. uh, or it's more operationally complex. And so a product would make the most sense, but it has generally lower margins because uh, you have cost of goods, unless you can figure out like a, a Coca-Cola or, you know, something that's very, very like, you know, when you sell like stickers, you know what I mean? Or like there was a girl I know who sold um, magnet lashes right? Mm. Or whatever. It's like the cost in those is like 10 cents you sell for 20 bucks. It's like, great. You know what I mean? Like yeah. where you can just sell air, right? Like that's, that's always been my like moniker for when I'm looking at businesses is unique, expensive, sticky air. So I want something that only I can sell. Um, I want it to be very, uh, very expensive premium, uh, air, very low cost, uh, and sticky, something that people keep buying. And so like, if I look for all four of those things, then I try and find a manager who is hardworking, has an impeachable character, um, and is super sharp. Mm. And so if I, and has a long-term owner mindset. So it's like, if I put those things together, like I have a business. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Any advice for Jack? I think I'm pretty perfect. <laughs> Jack's like, yeah. do not give me any more <laughs> yeah. advice, please. Yeah. Mustache and yeah. Mustache just, and get ripped. Yeah. It just gets folded. Yeah. I'm trying not. <laughs> I can't wait to see this Tinder date. Yeah. She we'll worth it? I was, I was about to ask, I was yeah. like, is she worth it? We'll see. We'll see. Does she I know you're walking out, or are you finding somebody and like, I'm working on it. <laughs> she, she <doesn't> <laughs> That's the real challenge. Honestly, what if she stands you up after actually it'd be better. For That's the good video. content. Yeah, yeah. It really is. Yeah. But then you're doing it for the tube. Well, it's a, I, I disagree. Oh. I think what? Oh. What else? let's hear it. You sold out <laughs> guys. You will know when you see Jack's video on his channel, if he releases the, I walked a hundred miles, he sold out and he's doing it for YouTube. If he walks the 300 miles, you know, he stayed true to what well, he told here's Jack, the thing. Graham and I, here's the thing. If he walks 300 miles and doesn't film it. Yeah. Which Alex, you hated that idea. Though. You hated it too, Graham. I didn't I, like the idea. Well, I was kind of, okay. I'm all for like personal goals. And <laughs> I think that Graham needs to like do more fun things. Graham. and uh i don't think so you, 
<laughs> no. Oh, okay. Anyway, oh. <laughs> yeah. it, but you know, so I was kind of giving you some slack because it's like you know we're vlogging, we're having fun, but if it's truly like your goal and it's truly what's going to make you happy and it's going to give you life fulfillment, then I say do it. And you know, but if you're changing your your goal based on doing a YouTube video, then it's not really like. Uh, unless unless your personal goal is like being fulfilled by YouTube, but when you pitched it to Graham and I, you know, you said it was for you. So I, yeah. you know, we'll I gotta find say, out. from my experience, and you know this too. I think filming it ruins it. It takes you out of the moment, and I I have to force myself to film. But like, there's some things it's like I have less of an experience because I have a camera up. Yeah, and even just thinking of the camera or trying to get the shot or trying to think of like how I could structure it. Well, I have one quick yes. one because you said cool. something, uh, Alex, yeah. to, to Graham about like the working thing. Um, I mean, a lot of people used to get on me about like, you need more work life balance, like blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, I just like you have one life and they are your terms and no one else's terms. And we optimize typically for the things that we enjoy doing. And like, if you have more stimulus from working than you do from not working, then like work. And then if you feel like at some point you have traded off something that you don't want to trade off for, then you can adjust. That's what I've always felt. I enjoy yeah. working. Yeah. Um, like what was it? My mom. Um, so we have, we have like, um, a wedding to go to mm -hmm. on, uh, the day after my birthday. Yeah. So we were talking about, uh, you know, we have to fly up on my birthday. She's like, oh, we could do this on your birthday. And this. And I was like, no, I just want to work. She's like, no, but it's your birthday. You shouldn't have to work. And I was like, I want to work. Yeah. That's all I want to do. I just want to work. Even uh, Santa Monica, my birthday. I was like, the only thing I want to do today is work. That was it. <laughs> just I'm, wanted to work. I mean, everybody wants to, they're like, man, do, some, do, do, do something you love and you'll never work another day in your life. But like, it's just because everyone has this really poor definition of work. But like, if if you have accomplished that, which obviously you have, like you're just living, yeah. And like what you do in life. So I'll I'll, I'll rewind something really quickly, which is like 2021. I did nothing. So like I owned all the companies, pounded out a lot of cash flow, and I did nothing. And it was a very miserable year for me because I tried to spend the money that I was making and I couldn't. Like it was just not even really a possibility. And so like. I got into a place of like, why, why am I even doing this? Like, what's the point? Like, I'll never even be able to spend this money that I have. Like, why have I been doing all this stuff? Um, and in starting acquisition.com or at least making that the sole focus now again, and being able to build all the infrastructure, you know, hire the teams and all the stuff that we're doing on that side of the business. Like I have so much joy getting back into the game. Uh, cause I feel like I've been kind of like in a super high leverage position for like an extended period of time. Um, that I exited the business because I thought that that was what the next natural step was supposed to be, which is like you go from CEO to owning it as a shareholder or board of directors, whatever. And that is very much what happened. Um, but I realized that for me, at least, it's like I work to create options, not to not work. And so a lot of people like they work really hard to not have to work later. It's like, no, no, it's like I work to have the option to work. And so I can choose to work and that choice is the freedom that I have. And so like, if I'm choosing with the optionality that I have to work, then that is exactly what I want to do. And so, um, just being on the other side of it, of like going to the, like, there's literally no way I can spend this money for the rest of my life mountaintop. Um, like the only thing that I wanted to do was the thing that got me here, which is like, I love working. And mm -hmm. so it's the thing that I find meaningful. And I think that maybe you shift direction in terms of like, maybe some of the stuff that you create, like maybe there's some things that you create that are for YouTube versus like for Graham. And yeah. I just think that it just slowly optimizes to only doing things for Graham, hmm. which a lot of times still ends up being that, but like you get there backwards. Yeah. It's like, if you made it purely for you, then you might be able to make a video after that. That's like, I walked 300 miles and I didn't film anything. And this is what I learned. Like that would probably be a really valuable video because you probably would have some interesting insights. Like I didn't film either of the Grant Cardone videos and then just like, made videos about the calls of like my takeaways and they were still really great videos. Interesting. I, okay. So my only <laughs> thought to that is like, uh, you are in a very unique position because you run this, this business with your wife and, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. And I think that marriage plays a big part in my life. Yeah. And I think marriage is a compromise. And so, um, my, my wife doesn't like it when I work as much and, and her, I guess her, her like love language is what quality time mm -hmm. or whatever. And I think Graham 
his girlfriend Macy is similar and I think that there's a compromise there where yes Graham if all he wants to do is work that's great and he can work and work and work but I think that marriage uh, a successful marriage is truly a compromise and if if it were, turns out that you know like like this you is really good I have like so many thoughts right now mm-hmm. yeah I, I, it's stimulating conversation and, <laughs> and I so, think yeah and I think everybody's in a unique position because um you know definitely like there's you you could say well you know i'm gonna grind away now so that you know i i don't have to work in the future and we can spend time together um or you can kind of balance and live in the now and live in the future but i think everybody's kind of in a unique position but i think that that part of your life is 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 always going to be a compromise to some sort of extent so i think it's a belief that you choose to define it that way Uh, yeah i'm okay yeah i'm okay with compromise is a belief statement like that's not a statement of fact that is a belief and so like i don't believe that marriage is compromise tell like, us your experience with that because i have a because i'm sure we all have different experiences yeah. mine in the beginning was that i did find that there was a compromise because mm-hmm. macy came from the mindset like you know five or six p.m comes around mm-hmm. uh you're done with work yeah and you're free and my mind works 24 mm-hmm. 7. uh i tried that and i woke up really early i'd wake up at like 5 a.m yeah. so i could be done by 5 p.m and have yeah. the night and I, that worked for actually quite a while because I actually found I was so productive in those morning hours that I could be done by five and be yeah. like, oh, wow, this is great. Uh, but over a long time trying to figure out like a, like a balance, I found myself, I wasn't myself. Like I, I was really, I felt anxious. I was just like uptight. I was um why just like, about what part like uh, because no beca- work, because or? because i couldn't work during the hours that i wanted to work like sometimes oh, okay. i just you just have those sure. those days where it's just like no no i'm so focused and i yeah. got it like i you have that concentration you just yeah. have to continue and so having that freedom for me if i don't have that i just wasn't myself and i was miserable yeah i mean i this is what i'm going to say and i i i have very strong views um and they are not common um but i also think that I don't want to live a common life and so that I cannot have common views. Right. So just like as a, as a big disclaimer to that, um, like I've only seen two dynamics that work in relationships over like an extended period of time. Um, one is kind of the, the, like we're in it together. And the other is like the, you know, cheerleader and quarterback, like cheering you on. But the thing is, is like, I can tell, I can speak a lot to the, you know, we're in the game together. Um, for me, I know personally, like I had two very long relationships that were cheerleader dynamics. Um, and to me, I could not imagine living life that way, having now lived what I live now. Um, because like, there's a certain amount of shared respect that you never get with somebody who does not know what it's like to be in the battlefield or in the arena. Um, and if I'm like, I need to work for the next three days and like write five book chapters, like there's not a discussion. It's like, of course, do your thing. There's no like, there's no like, I can't believe you're like, uh. and to the flip side in the cheerleader dynamic, a cheerleader who's really rooting for the team doesn't ask the quarterback to come out when the game's on the line. And so I think that a lot of people are running in what they consider to be cheerleader dynamics, but they are inverted dynamics. Mm-hmm. They're actually sabotaging the game. And um, I think that it's like, in that dynamic, it's harder, in my opinion, to do the cheerleader quarterback because you have to have a very aligned mission and goals of like the relationship. It's easier to do that in um, in the dynamic that you're working together because it's so clearly stated with the mission and the goals of like this is where I want to go and this is how I want to get there and like do you want to come with me? And then you're very much operating on this shared sense of reality, and it also becomes difficult for entrepreneurs, in my opinion. Now, like, I mean, I'm sure you've seen plenty of people get divorces as they get older and whatnot. Is that like if you're like, all right, this will be interesting. Mm-hmm. So typically um, when people become attracted, so Esther Perel, if you've heard of her, she's no. really interesting, like relationship person. She's like one of the top Ted talks on it. Um, there's a thing it's called mating, mating captivity is her book. Um, but in the beginning you have kind of this mystery because you don't know each other and that's what creates like the excitement, right? And as you get to know each other over time, you swing like from uh, mystery to familiarity, right? Um, you get a little bit more security, you get to know each other better and it feels like more and more amazing. And so what you do is you just keep trying to do that, right? But what ends up happening is that you overcorrect and then you become siblings. And then it's like, ah, well that's not good. And mm-hmm. so there, it's not a problem to be solved, but a, a dichotomy to be managed right? In terms of like how much space do you create versus how much familiarity? What happens when people uh, like entrepreneurs specifically like 
have their business and they uh, have the wife, they spend more time in the beginning and all of a sudden they don't spend as much time together and then they grow apart because they're also um, uh, exposed to different stimuli, mm -hmm. right? And so you adapt to the stimuli that you have and then you grow apart. Um, on the flip side, if you're in my scenario where we're like doing the same thing together, the downside of this one, these couples make five times more money than any of the other uh, versions that I just said. But the uh, you can become too familiar and then you just become siblings. So for us, we actually create more space. So it's like we try to work on separate sides of the house. We don't attend the same meetings. So like at the end of the day, we can sit down at dinner and be like, how was your day? And she can tell me something rather than me saying like, oh, I was there, I know, right? Yeah. And so the, the happiest couples are actually couples that have uh, uh, both have careers that are not necessarily together. So on average, these couples are the ones that, because they have a shared goal in terms of like, this is what we want to do. They have shared values in terms of how they want to get there. Um, and they respect one another and they respect each other's goals. And then they walk kind of in parallel. So you've got the, like, I'm working the entrepreneur and you've got the stay at home wife. There's many times everyone's seen that one go wrong. There's the, like, we're both working together in it where you, so he, these people have to, uh, uh, correct for trying to create more familiarity. These ones have to create more space. So you have the space to mm -hmm. be missed. And then these ones tend to be in the middle already. And so they just kind of like have to keep walking. And so for me, it was actually just interesting seeing the the different dynamics um, and like how we had to correct in the beginning. Like we were wait, we spent all day every day together and the business was small. So it was like, she was there and I was here and we worked out together and we ate together and we did that for like two years. And I was like, you know, Maybe I'll sit on different meetings than you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like seeing the level of like commitment and loyalty that you get from that. And I don't know. So I went on a little bit of a tangent there, but I, I have strong beliefs around, around that. And I think that you don't have to compromise anything if you don't want to. That's it. I think yeah. maybe we just have different goals because my oh, totally, goal is yeah. not to make a boatload of money with my wife. My yeah. goal in life is to be happy, have a great relationship and just enjoy life. And honestly, if I live my entire life, like, you know, as long as I don't go broke, I, I think I'm going to be happy. And, and that's okay to yeah. disagree with somebody and have different goals totally. because everybody, yeah, everybody has different goals. So does that mean you would, you would, you agree with, with Kelsey in the sense that like, you'd rather be, have a, have a more like predictable schedule, spend more time together, build a family. I think it's a, it's a balance for me. Right. Because, um, that's my like long, like if, if, if this job, if I was working for you and it was so intense and I knew it was going to be intense, like till the day I die, like to the fact where it's going to affect my relationship, mm -hmm. I don't care how much money I'm making like personally. Um, but it's also a balance because we want like i'm not oblivious to money right like i i want to make more money i want to reach for more i want to do things um but i still want to keep my first goal in mind which is to be happy and like i said i don't i i, I think one time like graham like pulled me aside and asked me like how much money i want to make in the future we were just having like yeah. a conversation and i didn't have like a specific number but i was just like you know just enough to like you know, not have to stress about money. And, you know, that's a different number for different people because we all have a different... It also changes. Yeah, it but, also but changes. Alex, <laughs> yeah, do, you, do you feel like, because you're above that number now, do you feel like you stress about money still? Uh, yes, but I feel like that's only because I have that, uh, like I live like I'm like going to be broke the next day mentality. Like I'm like, like, like in my head, I'm like, well, if this all just disappears the next day, like... Yeah, because uh, yeah. I because I remember you you telling me that number and you're you're above that number, and I I think we could double it from here and you would still have the exact same mentality of just like well the you know still live you get hundred dollars I'll just tell you yeah. it yeah. doesn't it doesn't go away. Yeah. Um, so how do you how do you as somebody who's made a ton of money and yeah. and you know how do I because Graham's right like I we kind of reached that. Mm -hmm. number and i'm like I, I i've accepted the fact that this thought right is mm -hmm. not going to go away mm -hmm. so what do you do like what do you do like i really i'm kind of i maybe you could give me some advice about that <laughs> maybe i'm the one you should be giving advice to i guess there's so many statements i was trying to like keep tra like keep track but like mm -hmm. you make a lot of belief statements um and so like when i'm like a lot of people make statements like as they're like isms like this is this way um like i have this thought and it is um 
and you're like, and I've just accepted that, like, I'm always going to have this. Like, I would just never speak that over yourself just right off the bat because, like, you're just saying I'm never going to get over this thing. Like, the statement you said earlier about, like, um, I, at the end of the day, I just, like, I just want to be happy. Like, when you admit that you just want to be happy, then what happens is you create a deficit between your current reality and happiness, which means that it doesn't matter what happens because there will always be happiness that is outside of yourself. Does that make sense? Kind of, yeah. I mean, but I would consider myself happy. No, okay. no, he, he no, didn't get that at all. No, Alex, I, I, got, I, I got it because I'm like, look at the jet, like, oh man. But I thought, okay, so here's my, here's my interpretation Jeez. of it. If I'm telling myself that I just want to be happy, mm -hmm. then I will never be happy Correct. is what you're saying. Yeah, Correct. No, I understand what you're saying. Right. But I'm telling you right now that I am happy now. Good. So, but, it, okay. Wait, Graham, I, why, do you still think I don't understand that? No, <laughs> no, but I, I think um, the, 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 so like deficits, deficits occur when we speak desires, right? And so um, I love this statement. Um, a desire is a contract we make with ourselves to be unhappy until we get what we want. And so whenever we state a desire, like I want this, I want this amount of money, I want whatever, you literally sign a contract that says like, I won't be unhappy until that happens, right? And so like, I had this thing earlier on where I was like, I want to have meaning. I want to have great meaning in my life. And I was talking to a guy who made a lot more money than me. Um, and he was like, cause I asked him, I said, how do you create and destroy meaning in your work? That was the question I asked him on a, on a podcast. Um, and he was like, why do you think life needs to be meaningful? And it was the same exact thing as the happiness versus like the meaning thing where it's like, I say life has to be meaningful and therefore everything that I'm doing, like I create this expectation of life. Whereas if life just is, it just is. And it's the only way that you can actually be there. Um, it's just, it's just pure acceptance. Right. Um, which is why like the whole like shoulds of like, we should work, we should have balance. We should X. It's like, I believe marriage is a compromise. Like these are just statements of belief that are casting expectations out in the world that are just bound to be untrue at some point and then create dissonance. And so it's like, I believe marriage is marriage. And I believe my marriage is my marriage. And I believe your marriage is your marriage. And like, I believe that I can work 24 hours a day if I want to. And that is all period, not, and it's bad or, and it's good. And there's no judgment on it. It just is. And so like, if I get, you know, if I get <laughs> dopamine secreted in my brain, when I start working, cool, like, and I will optimize for dopamine. And if I die, I know that in a thousand generations, nothing I do anyways is going to matter. So who cares? Like, that's like the, the opening thing in my book is like, there are no rules. Like we live in this, like this, like shoulds and have tos and like, like happiness, everyone talks about it. And it's just like, everyone is unhappy because they say they want to be happy rather than being like, accepting like fuck happiness. Like I just am period. Mm -hmm. And then like, I don't need to judge the am it just is. How do you, what do you say to that? <laughs> I don't like, know. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Cause so one thing I noticed yeah. is if you're like, I just want to be happy. Yeah. Does that mean Alex that you think that at some point that will change for you or something or you're, you have, you live with no, fear I think, that that will change? I think you guys maybe are taking what I'm saying the wrong way. I mean, like, like, um, Alex is saying, you know, everybody has different beliefs and there's no one rule fits all to everybody. And so if I say I want to be happy, that doesn't make me wrong. Like if I want to live my life that way, that's perfectly fine. But the, the thing that, that what Jack is saying is no, I am like happy. Like I, but I, for me, I like to make like a conscious effort to work towards that. And Alex can live his life. Like <laughs> life is life. My marriage is my marriage. Um, and it works for him. And that generates happiness, whether he's like thinking but about it. But it doesn't have to generate happiness. That's the point. Yes. Right, that's right the there. point. Yes. Yes. Like, right. Like, but like, because it makes it like, not because it's like when, when people say like, Hey, um, work, uh, you know, set these goals and like the rest will take care of itself. It still makes the rest taking care of itself. The reason that you're doing it, which means that it's actually not getting around it. When people are like, you gotta be process driven. If you're like, if we focus on the process, the goals take care of themselves. It still means that the goals are important. So like you have to, if, if you want to make the transition from like a process driven life, which is like, I'm doing these things to do them period. Then the, so that I can be happy so that I can have a good marriage so that I can have a meaningful life has to disappear from the equation. It has to be, I do them, period. Not because I do them. But mm. then it goes back the other way. Like, but why? Because you say so. Like, 
Because you want to, right? Like, if you want to have, if you want to ascribe a meaning to why you're doing something, you can do it for whatever reason. Wow. This is deep. So I, I mean, this is yeah, what I spent yeah. a lot of my time thinking of because I have nothing yeah. else to do. And this is what my last year was, was yeah. like trying to figure out like why, why I, I didn't have, like, I, I felt the exact same way while I was, while I had nothing as yeah. to where I have now. I feel the same. Like, like people are like, man, it was cool when the money hit my account. I felt nothing like truly like not even like the two day, high, like I, it was irrelevant how did you learn all of this did was this through speaking with other people who have who've been there before you thinking um i mean my closest friend is a philosopher and i use that in terms of like the actual meaning of the word philosopher so like philae to love and then sophos is wisdom or knowledge so like he's a lover of knowledge lover of wisdom and like we talk every week it's like the only standing meeting that i have is we talk for like two hours and we just talk about life and he's one of these guys who like lives in a cave um and it's like he got his phd when he was 20 like just a very brilliant guy and so he and i just talk about things you know you should uh share his contact information <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look for yeah, some yeah. guests on the podcast oh i mean yeah. he's brilliant i mean if you like dr gashi is brilliant he's the he's the smartest human that i know in terms of like brilliance and their ability to communicate it um in a, in a simple way um and so he helped me get over a lot of the things that I, that I used to struggle with. And a lot of it was just like the language that we use matters a lot because like how we say things is how we think things. And so like what I was saying earlier, Alex, and this is not like, this is not like a, a slight. I'm just saying like, when I hear, like when I hear anyone talk like on my team or, or customers or whatever, it's like people talk so many things over themselves and they're like, I don't know why I'm not successful. And it's like, well, define success. And why are you not? And then what are the, you know what I mean? Like, I just want to do this to be ha like, there's so many chains that they put on themselves that it be becomes very difficult to live. And so like, I spent a long time trying to not do that. Um, and it was just because like, I was unhappy and I didn't like being unhappy. And then I stopped judging myself for being unhappy. And then I stopped thinking about it altogether. And so I think that like, I'll give you a really real example for this. Mm. So one of the things that I'm vehemently opposed and I'm like, you, no one give Graham flack. You can give it to me. Um, and like, this is coming from a family who like had al alcoholics and, and drug addicts and things like that. Like, I really don't like the alcoholics anonymous, um, concept of every morning waking up and saying, I am an alcoholic high, you know, whatever. And then they go into their, in their meetings because what it does is it puts it at the forefront of their mind and they, they literally label themselves every morning as having this problem right? When somebody who's not an alcoholic just doesn't think about it. They don't think I'm an alcoholic. I have to fight not drinking every day. They just don't think about it. And so I think to the same degree that, um, like living a meaningful life is not saying like, oh, I'm living a meaningful life. You just are, and you're not casting it. You're just, you just are. But don't you think some of that is just that inherent belief that some people just have, they're raised from that, they have positive experiences that totally. turns into a spiral. But the people who don't have that, who mm -hmm. are used to every day being like, I'm worthless, I suck at this, I am bad at this. Don't you think that maybe that like first step and like getting in that direction is positive affirmations of like, I could do it, I could, isn't that like, that's better than zero. Like, I feel like we're going to zero to one. Cause like I think at least it's exiting, it's, I think it's exiting the equation altogether. So it's saying I am worthless instead of saying like, I want to be worthy or I am worthy, just saying worthiness doesn't matter. But then wouldn't you get just people not caring at all? Yes. Yeah. So I'm a hundred percent a nihilist. Yeah. Like I believe that we die, nothing happens. And like, sure. you know, it is what it is. Right. But, um, and there are different ways to take that. Some people are like, life is meaningless and there's no point in any of it, which I would agree with them. And then the other people are like, there's no point in any of it. And so I'll do what I want. And some people see that as like a very, very, very self-serving, which it might be. Um, but to the same degree, like you are released from the chains of the expectations of others. And most people, in my opinion, that I have witnessed who are unhappy is because they are weighted down by the chains of their parents, of their friends, of their siblings, of the whatever things, the people that they believe are casting judgment on them. And they care so much about that person's disapproval that they don't want to do the things that they want to do. And so if I think it's easier to get someone to realize that none of it matters and then build from there than to try and flip the negatives. It's just to exit the equation altogether. Just say none of this matters. Therefore, I will start my YouTube channel and not care if my dad says that YouTube isn't real. Like, it's not about being worth it. Like, this is one where they're like, I deserve success. I'm like, no, you don't. 
No one deserves anything. But you can do the stuff that gets success independent of your deservingness. You can be a terrible person and get and become successful. So that person doesn't deserve it, but they did the things that create success. If we define success as some material, whatever. And so I think um, like if you can exit the equation of like labeling yourself and then just doing because because what else will you do while you are alive? Um, it creates some le levels of freedom that um, allow for clarity of thought and also for the ability to take risks that most people can't take. And I candidly, I understand mm. the difficulties. Yeah. It's not like I'm like some perfect, like, you know, like nihilist who just like never believes anything matters and doesn't get upset. Like, of course I do. But like my instant self-help is like whenever something happens, it's like, I'm going to die and it's not going to matter. And that like, it's like, it just got so ingrained in me now that like, it's okay. But would you yeah. consider yourself emotional? Yeah. I mean, probably. So I think I have emotions. Got it. Because a lot of the times, at least in my experience, like, and, and what I've seen, people that are nihilist, it's easy to, that's like an easy out. If something bad happens, if something good happens, it's just like, oh yeah, that's fine. Sweep it under the rug. It's not, it's not like it matters anyways. Something yeah. bad happens. And it's not like you actually deal with or process whatever, you know, event or action occurred that make you felt that emotion. If we believe that we have to, like, why should we? Why should you feel that emotion? Like, why should we process a traumatic event? Like, what does that mean? Well, I do believe that there are like, you know, things in your brain biologically that if they are deprived of something or there's like uh, some some bad traumatic event or something like yeah. that will affect your so what makes biological you traumatic versus non traumatic. I, tra I mean, I feel like the definition of the word trauma would probably. But what would be the line between like, OK, in like, let's let's give an example of something terrible, right? Um, actually not because it's a podcast and people might hate on grab. So let's just say something bad happens that we describe as bad in this culture, right? In another culture that might not be bad. It's trauma in this culture. It's not trauma in this culture. So if the circumstance is the same, why was it traumatic? Circumstances weren't the same. Why not? Because the culture. The facts were the same. Well, we describe the facts as changed, which means that we can choose to call something trauma. But wouldn't... Isn't it, doesn't it make sense that people would be built up I'll due give, to culture and environment? 40 year old guy sleeps with a 15 year old girl. Terrible, right? Rewind 200 years. 40 year old guy sleeps with a 15 year old girl. 100% normal, right? How is it trauma now and not trauma then? And mind you, like this is not my statement. I'm just, I'm, you have to pull an extreme example if we're gonna talk about trauma to, to illustrate the concept, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's traumatic in one instance and not traumatic in another, then it means that we can basically change the cultural narrative that we're ascribing to our context and make it not traumatic. That makes sense. Right, which means it didn't matter. Which means the only thing that matters is that you chose to make it meaningful. But let's say like like the, the, the passing of a parent or yeah, like a loved 100%. one or something like that. If we think, like we feel like we have this, we have a narrative that says, if I don't mourn, it means I didn't care about them, right? Mm -hmm. That's a statement of belief. I could say that if I don't mourn about them, it means I totally cared about them. Like, why does my mourning have any indication of how much I cared? They're non-correlates, right? But it's just because we have, like, we have so many of these belief statements that, like, quote, society or things that we inherit, right? But we just choose to say that this is how life is. And so it's, I think it's just like monitoring what those statements are. And so like one of my favorite, one of my favorite sayings, probably like if I had one thing on my tombstone, um, it would be, it would be a, a, a permutation of a, a quote by Orson Scott Card, which is, um, we question all of our beliefs, except for those that we truly believe and those we never think to question. <laughs> That's a good mm. quote. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, we like, oh, I, of course I'm opening to questioning my beliefs. It's like, what's trauma? Like when someone's like, I was traumatized. It's like, were you? Or do you just choose to label it as trauma and then now you fucked up the rest of your life because you call it trauma when 200 years ago it was life and a thousand years ago having your parent killed in front of you was just nature if you want to go biology right and so we're just like we just choose to create meaning around things and so like at the end of the day like end to end to end bottom 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 root yeah all our brains do is just create and destroy meaning and so we say this is a threat this is not a threat we make like we need to reinforce this behavior we don't need to reinforce this behavior all through meaning Mm -hmm. And so if you can control what you deem, deem meaningful, you can massively shift the odds in your favor because you don't need to ascribe meaning yeah. to 
Well, couldn't that be, let's say, like like 500 years ago, you see like a parent killed in front of you. Isn't that because all you have in your mind is like food, shelter, water? Sure. And now that we have these things taken care of, our minds go to other places. Sure. Yeah. I just don't think it changes the actual facts. So it's like we have, we have there's there's stimulus response, right? And so like we get to control the response, we control the stimulus. And so like, was it, um, it's either Seneca or Epictetus who's like, no one yells at a rock, right? And so it's like, if you are the rock, then like, just it doesn't matter. <laughs> Right, like you just like eventually, like people just fuck off and just leave you alone. Mm. And so, like, and if you si- if you see stimulus of life that way, in terms of like how you deem things or label things traumatic or not traumatic or good or bad, you know, what I mean, it's the same thing. With, I'm sure with like the hate comments and whatnot. Is like if you deem the comments of of the fans as meaningful, then you will both care about them being positive and you will care about them being negative. Mm-hmm. But if they're not meaningful at all to begin with, then like I don't think you can do either. I think you just either have to participate in both sides or you remove. That sure. is also a belief statement, right? So like maybe you can. Um, so, you know, interesting thoughts. So how did you transition from, pro- assume, I'm assuming you used to care a little bit more about beliefs yeah. and stuff like that. How did you transition from that to now not caring? And like, did you have to completely change your mindset to where 100%. your automatic response to things was just like, what, what are these chains of emotions and like mm-hmm. the cultural constraints and stuff like that 100%. that are making me feel this way? Yeah. That did, did you just switch that light switch or do you still on occasion catch yourself totally. slipping? Oh, I just did stuff. right now. I was like, I just said that as a belief. Right. That's what right. I figured. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you systematically, you hear like, that's why the talking is so important. Like what words are we using? What do those words mean? Like you say trauma, I'm like define that. What do you mean by that? Mm-hmm. Which is why like when you hear really good writing that's academic, like the first few pages will be like, we're going to talk about this and this is how we define this. And this is how we define this. It's like, we're con- putting constraints around the words that we're using because they mean they, they equate to thoughts. They're just buckets, right? That we like say a word like trauma and like it means something different to all three of us. So it's like, we have to agree on the definition before we can talk about it. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, no, I had, um, so I, I, I definitely made uh, a conscious effort. So when I was like 19 or 20, I became a born again Christian. Um, the dunk, the whole thing was like, oh my God, life's amazing. Jesus is great. Um, and then um, I ended up falling away from that because I was like, I don't know if this is true. Um, and, uh, and then I spent the next five years um, dedicated to apologetics, which is defensive faith of the Christian faith. So just learning the arguments around like why Christianity like is true, mm-hmm. right? Um, I ended up not believing on, uh, in it, and I can give a variety of reasons, but I'll, I'll give you the simplest one. Um, hopefully I'm not insulting anyone. This is just my belief that I'm sharing, um, which is a lot of, one of the biggest, one of the strongest arguments for Christianity against other world religions is that um, other world religions say like, if you go to the good place, so if you do a good job, you go to the good place, right? And fundamentally that's, it's a, it's a hard paradigm because it means like at what point are you 51% good versus 49%? Should I have just held one more door open and I would have gone to the good place forever, right? Not even talking about like finite circumstances and creating infinite outcomes, but like whatever. Um, and so if you can draw that line, then it makes, it, it kind of makes it ridiculous, right? It like kind of breaks down on the like be a good person system, right? And so that's all worldviews with the exception of Buddhism and Christianity. With Christianity, they're like, you don't have to be good, you just have to have faith. And if you have faith in Jesus and you go to the good place, right? And so the the reason that for me fundamentally i didn't believe in that was because you actually create another false binary which is believe or not believe when in reality is to what extent you believe it's how hard you believe and again you create another 50 percent line which is should i believe one percent more and then i would go Mm -hmm. into the good place forever right Mm -hmm. so um anyways the point is is that i i studied apologetics for a long period of time um and then i was really sad um and i was just like being said i was like fuck happiness i was like i'm just going to do stuff that i think is cool and that was like that was like the first break in the chain for me um my slogan to myself was actually just fuck happiness um and that was wildly freeing because i stopped judging myself for not being happy and then i was just like oh i'm like i am unhappy i'm like cool whatever and i just kept going and all of a sudden just like stopped mattering to me hmm like, I don't think about it. I genuinely, like, I don't think, like, does this make me happy? Does not, like, I don't think about it. You just do what you want to do in the moment? Just do whatever I feel like doing. Yeah. And it's not like it's, like, all short-term, like, all pleasure-seeking, whatever. Like, I still have a long-term perspective of, like, this is what I want to build. Yeah. Like, I want to write these books. I want to build these courses. Um, I want to do this stuff. But it's, like, those are things that I enjoy. 
so that's what I that's what I do. I love it. <laughs> it's great. All right. I don't have anything to say. <laughs> no, I mean, I had questions, I mean, but now I'm I know the li- answers to them just I'm based just off listen- here. I'm just listening. Yeah. Like, I'd rather just listen and not say anything. <laughs> I know. You know? It's <laughs> like, I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> but then I created a belief that now yeah, I'm going to mess yeah. it up. So oh, just, God. <laughs> Why does not, it matter, man? Yeah. Why does it even matter that I messed it up yeah. to begin with? It doesn't. <laughs> and you can't mess it and up. And then the comments are going to be, Greg oh, messed it up. And then look at the comments. Why does that matter? I know it's, I mean, I know it's crazy stuff, but like, I think that like, if you want to, like you can't do what 99% of people are doing if you want to be in the 1%. Yeah. Like fundamentally. And so like you have to have like what I would consider like maybe uncomfortable conversations just be like that's okay. Like cool. Like I just I'm going to do my thing and then they're like and the thing is a lot of times if you just even just make your statements of like this is how I believe like people feel like you're attacking them. Especially if you articulate it well. Cuz they're like why well, I, I don't I'm like cool. Like I, I don't give a shit. like do whatever you want. Like mm-hmm. it's all good to me. Um and so, which is why I don't talk about it as much publicly. Right. How about uh, this? Yeah. What bothers you? There's got to be something out there that like... I also have another question. Time. <laughs> people wasting your time. That's that's a really good answer. That's a, that's a great one. answer. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I only, it's the only thing I don't have a uh, lot of. This may seem like a silly question, but if you go to a restaurant and you order something, let's say you order a steak and you order it medium well, and it yeah. comes back medium rare. Yeah. Do you say something? It's not worth its time. <laughs> no, I, I don't actually. You don't? No. Why would I? I don't care. But at the same time, I was like, well, a lot of people would be anxious to say something. And I figured you probably wouldn't care about those emotions, right? I wouldn't even have an emotion first. I mean, that's yeah, such I, a non, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Really yeah. I mean, maybe like, in a, like, like we have a, a big ad campaign that's supposed to go out and like, I get all the creatives the day before and it's supposed to launch. Like, would that annoy me? I'd be like, yes, but let's fix it. You know, like this is bad. We can't run this. Let's try again, you know? And in the end, it won't matter because we're all going to die and this money is going to go back to the game. I'll give you this one analogy. This might be a good wrap up. Um, so this is like my mental analogy that I, that I, I don't know, makes sense to me, which is like, if, if, if life were a game, right. And all of us are given a token to like enter like a casino because we're in Vegas. Right. And so we're all get a, you know, a token. We enter the casino and we sit down at the table to play poker. Right. And everybody's playing, everybody's got cards and all of, you know, we're dealt, cards. Everybody's dealt different cards and we got to play the hand we're dealt. And depending on our level of skill, we amass more and more chips throughout the game. Right. And, um, at the end of the game, the difference between the real world and the casino in the, the, the game of life, right. In the real world, you just, you go and you can cash out your chips and you walk out with money and there you go. There's your day. Um, but I feel like in the casino of life, you get tapped on the shoulder by the grim reaper and he says, your time's up. And then all your chips get pushed right back to the middle of the table. And then you leave the casino empty handed because it was a fake game with fake rules that didn't matter. And so like we accumulate these chips that I'm just going to push back in the middle again, that other people are going to play on. And like the reason that that analogy became real for me is like, I bought this piece of land in Austin and I was like, that's neat. And then I was like, how many people have owned this piece of land? It's like the guy, you know, the guy before me owned it and the guy before him owned it and the guy before him owned it. And I was like, and they were like, this is mine. And then they die or they sell it. Mm-hmm. And someone was like, this is mine. It's like, they're just chips that just get played with and they just get amassed and then they get redistributed. It just doesn't matter. Like death taxes everybody hundred percent. So like everyone's like estate planning. It's like, dude, 500 generations from now, like a, your, your offspring are, you know, 500 to the, you know, 0.5 or, you know, one half to the, 500th power of like diluted. They're basically just humans at that point. So if, if your wealth somehow is a big enough that it can be diluted that, that much, um, and it lasts that long, the people who own it are just humans. So to, like, they're so they're just as close to me as you are, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Right. Um, and then the alternative is the people that I'm giving this to are just the ones that I care about are the immediate family. But then when people get resources that they didn't learn how to, uh, use or manage, then it destroys them because it's too much potential energy. They can't handle it, right? And so it's like, it's really for nothing. And so like, if you want, you can build something that you think is cool. Um, but like at the end of the day, like we're just gonna cash the chips in. So anyways, Alex's worldviews, but. Wow. <laughs> it's a great it's analogy. Just lots, of, <laughs> just lots, lots to think about this one. Yeah, I'm gonna have to yeah. rewatch this. But you know. Like, yeah, the, you know what's funny? I was actually thinking I would yeah, I rewatch never this. listen to podcasts over <laughs> no, But never. this segment. I would, I would actually listen to this. Yeah. Segment. Yeah. Money, income, no earth. Ooh.
yeah. <laughs> investing, <Wow>. indexes, <laughs> savings accounts, what credit cards? <laughs> <laughs> that's good Jeez, thank you so much no, thank you alex for coming is, on this has been an incredible podcast yeah really I so I, I appreciate i appreciate you having me and, and to the audience like i know that a lot of the stuff that I, I say can be uh triggering and i know that at different points in my life if i had heard someone say what i'm saying in the position that i am i would be offended um and i want to make it clear that it's not my intention to do that um at all uh it's just me sharing beliefs that uh as i understand the world and that is no way projection on you or how you see the world, et cetera. It's just, this is how I see the world. And these are beliefs that serve me well, um, that helped me overcome um, a lot of things that I thought mattered. That you thought, there we go. That was it. That Perfect. should be our intro. Yeah. <laughs> that could be our intro, honestly. That's a, yeah. that's a good segment to put right there in the beginning because yeah. it's going to catch people's attention where they were like, what, what's offensive? Yeah. What's, yeah. <laughs> what am I going to disagree with? Perfect. Let's do that. Thank you so much. Thanks no, for coming bad, on, man. It was it. nice meeting you, too. No, thank you. Good oh luck on gosh. your Tinder date. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. You should grow the stash out by that. Uh, you think so? I mean, if you want to slide. That's why I shaved oh, it yeah. last night, by the way. I all have to get some thumbnails up. Oh, yeah. One sec. Oh, my God. Oh, that, that was incredible.